Okay? Yes? Good. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being at the Public Safety Committee meeting this morning. Uh, the public safety members are uh, Vice President Hucker and Council Member Albernaz and myself, and we're very pleased to be joined by Council Members Jawando and Rice. Um, the, and before, as we begin, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Christina, uh, Christine Wellens um, from uh, the, the legislative attorney for doing a very quick turnaround on this on this packet. This is a, a lengthy and uh, certainly a well thought out packet and she uh, was able to do it after a public hearing and within two days. So that, that's very impressive and most appreciated. And if I can mention that, that we, uh, my, it is my hope that we can get through this today and make a recommendation from the Public Safety Committee uh, today. Uh, I know that that, and we also, just to keep that in mind, we also have a joint a committee meeting with HHS and Councilmember Auburn is the chair of that. Immediately following this, it's slated at 11:30. So um, we're going to need to stay on on focus and and try our best to to get through all of these important topics. We certainly need to have the conversations, but we also need to move through because if we don't, I don't know how we're going to fit in another work session uh, because of everything else we're doing uh, before August. So. With that in mind, Ms. Wellens, would you like to lead us off, please? Um, yes, good morning, and thank you, um, Council President Katz and Council members. Good morning. Um, so I, I believe that the substance of the bill as drafted has been, you know, thoroughly described at introduction um, and also throughout the public hearing. So, and in the interest of time, I'll just try to jump right into the issues that have been brought up to your attention by staff. The first issue as well, of course, is by other council members and um, community members as well throughout the public hearing. So the first issue listed in the memo, the staff memo on page four is the issue of high risk no knock warrants. Um, some council members have indicated an interest in potentially banning these. Some other jurisdictions have done just that um, some jurisdictions, including in particular Louisville, Kentucky, have passed uh, what are called Brianna's Laws, of course, in honor of Brianna Taylor, and um, to, they prevent um, police officers from within a certain jurisdiction from applying for or participating in no-knock warrants. So I think just really quickly, the important background I think you need to know is that um, in general, the Supreme Court requires that officers have to knock and announce them, knock on a door and announce themselves when they're entering a private residence, residence in order to um, effectuate a search or seizure. There are two exceptions to that in the case law. There are exigent circumstances, um, and I think you know the perfect example is there's some type of hostage situation, perhaps. Um, and then the other exception is the no-knock warrant, where you go to the judge and get permission um, because of a concern about the destruction of evidence or other concerns about danger to the officer or other people in the premises. Um, so what I've laid out in the memo are three options that you might want to consider for addressing the issue of no-knock warrants, assuming that you want to address that in the bill taking into account the fact that there are those two um, exceptions to the knock and announce rule. So the memo that I presented on page five essentially would um, require that either in the scenario where you have a no-knock warrant or where you're seeking a no-knock warrant or the situation where there are exigent circumstances um, and, you're, and you're just acting in the moment, that you would only um, forego the knocking and announcing if there were exigent circumstances present, which of course that's required anyway. And then additionally, that the search and seizure or seizure involves a certain suspicion of a certain um, crime of a crime of violence as opposed to another type of crime. Um, that would be consistent with um, the fed, uh, federal legislation that's that's pending, uh, the known as the Peace Act, in which um, 
if it was passed through Congress, would ban federal agents from using no-knock warrants in drug cases. So that's kind of the idea behind that. Other options um, would be to, you know, of course, ban the no-knock warrants altogether. The exigent circumstances option would still be present. Uh, you could also, of course, ban any exceptions to the knock and announce rule, but, you know, you would have to take into account the fact that that tool wouldn't be available, you know, when it's perhaps needed. Um, and then I guess the fourth option would be just not to address this issue in the bill. I'm happy to try to answer any questions on that topic. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Chief Jones and ask him about no-knock warrants as well, please. Chief, how often do we have them? Could you give us some background on that, please? So, good morning. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. So, with our SWAT team, we execute, in general, with all of our investigative search warrants. There are over 600 that we do annually, on average. Of those 600 warrants that we do annually, not all of those warrants are executed by our SWAT team. For example, in 2019, we executed 140 search warrants by our SWAT team out of the 600 that we actually, 600 plus that we actually did in 2019, as an example. Of that 140 search warrants, 108 of those were no-knock warrants. Now, understand the process. When an investigator, there is Supreme Court law that binds the investigator and the police department of an execution of a no-knock warrant. For example, when we apply for a search warrant that has to go through judicial review by a judge, either district court or circuit court judge, that a judge has the right to either approve a no-knock warrant based upon what's written in the four corners of the warrant, not what the officer or investigator is telling them. What's written in the warrant is what the judge based their decision on. And once that decision is made, the judge can either approve or deny no-knock warrants. And no-knock warrants have to have information in there that notes about, from our perspective, it's about crimes of violence, a potential crime of violence, that the individual that we may be investigating, this individual has a history of violence, has a history of weapon possession. And so those things are important when we are presenting that to a judge. I will also note that when warrants, search warrants are being provided, they are also under review by the supervisor as well as an executive level officer. So just because an investigator may write in a warrant that they want a no-knock warrant, it may not even get to a judge. We have denied warrants that our investigators have put together for particular search warrants. And we have denied the no-knock exception because we felt like it didn't meet the minimum standards required even under judicial review. Now, I want to make sure that this is also clear. There are folks who believe that police departments all serve search warrants the exact same way. Well, that's not true. In the case in Louisville, in the Breonna Taylor case, for example, the search warrant was executed by the narcotics team. In Houston, they have a policy or had a policy that search warrants were executed by their narcotics teams for narcotics warrants. That doesn't happen here. Our narcotics teams don't do their own search warrants. Our investigators don't do their own search warrants when it's a no-knock warrant. And even in most cases of a knock and announce, not in most cases, but again, depending upon what is the warrant for, 
Um, and if, it, if again, if it's a warrant for, um, um, let's say, a crime of violence or narcotics, it still has to meet that test for a no-knock exception. And only those warrants are are actually executed by our SWAT team. Now, let me give you a little history about our SWAT team. Um, over the past, uh, I would say, during my entire career here, um, there have been um, numerous search warrants executed by our SWAT teams over the years. And during the course of those search warrants that were executed, again, these are some of the most trained um, officers that we have. They work together. They train, they train well together. Um, and um, over the years, um, they have, again, executed a number of no-knock warrants. Um, and of those no not warrants that they've had, um, again, we've only had, dating back to, I believe, the 1980s, and I may be even going back further than that, we've only had three involved shootings. Actually, in the nearly 40-year history of our SWAT team, we have only had three shootings um, during that time frame. Of course, you may be familiar with the one that we had earlier this year. That's the only shooting that we've had that resulted in death. Um, and there were some exigent circumstances involved in that, that case. Um, and so, um, and again, when we are looking at um, also understanding the, the risk that's involved of our officers entering um, in a high-risk situation um, involving individuals who may have weapons, um, those are, are some of the most dangerous situations. So, example, I will give you an example of just last week. Uh, we had a case that we were investigating involved in an individual that was a prohibited felon from having a firearm. We had information that he had a firearm. He, had, he was wanted for an aggravated assault. The investigator applied for a warrant, a no-knock warrant, the judge did not give give approval for the no knock warrant, which means we didn't execute it. We had to do a knock and announce. And when we knocked and announced, an individual the individual threw a gun out outside of the apartment. Uh, we made entry. Luckily, we made or made the arrest without any uh, without anyone being injured. But the reality is, is that and there were more weapons found in the residence. And the good news is, is that. This individual didn't go to find those weapons after we knocked and announced that, that we were coming. So, and he was a prohibited felon from having a weapon. These are the types of cases that, that concern us, particularly the amount of guns that we continue to get off our streets here in Montgomery County. Um, with individuals who have illegal firearms, ghost guns, um, all these types of other weapons that we are now seeing on our streets, um, involved in numerous uh, violent behaviors. And so I would suggest to you, from my perspective, is that, again, with the review that we have by our court system, that really does an excellent review. And, and you know, if people want to say they don't think our judges are good, um, I, think that's, I think that's a far fetch. I think our judges um, look at what's in the four corners of the warrant and make um, decisions that they think is the best for work. Um, that for that warrant to be served. So I think there's some additional information that I think Kelly Roberts, um, Associate County Attorney, can also provide in response to search warrants that I think will be helpful for this committee. Thank you very much, Chief. Uh, Vice President Hopper. Oh, um, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm unmuted, right? Um, uh, Christine, thank you for this great packet. And I appreciate, Mr. President, we began without an uh, uh, a lot of remarks, but I do want to thank the lead sponsors that are with us, the ones that aren't with us. I'm really glad that um, we're here discussing this bill that the community is very, very interested in. Um, uh, Christine, uh, in your potential amendment um, under six, where it, it includes murder, hostage taking, kidnapping, terrorism, human trafficking, sexual trafficking, or domestic violence, it, are all forms of sexual abuse? I, I thought these have been used a fair, a fair amount of times on domestic, uh, uh, on, on sexual abuse type cases, and are all those crimes covered under domestic violence, or would they need to be added in separately if not? 
the the including language is meant to be illustrative, not exclusive. So, and that and that's consistent with the way that we do drafting in other parts of the code. So, I would say that crime of violence would be broader than just these examples. Right. Is that we we're not under yeah. any obligation to imagine every possible exception. Um, right. Correct. Um, how? Can you comment on how well exigent circumstances are generally defined? I saw the CRS reference, but um, in in the case law, I mean, do you feel like if we were to ban them, knowing that judges can still use the exigent circumstances uh, exception uh, or consider, consideration, um, in your view, is that strong enough? Well, the issue is, I guess, in the, um, for no-knock warrants, the judges are finding that there are exigent circumstances. They do, they conduct that evaluation. So um, we would be precluding that in some or all situations. The other option is simply exigent circumstances without the benefit of the no-knock warrant. And that's really, as I understand it, the difference really turns on timing. So, you know, obviously it's preferable to go to a judge um, and, and appropriate in most cases, but if there's not time to go to a judge and there's a hostage situation, the police under exigent circumstances as described by the Supreme Court can enter. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, I don't feel I don't feel like I I can tell you, you know, really how well how well it's working or not. I mean, it's certainly from a policy perspective um, makes sense to me to, as Chief Jones was describing, to use this tool in situations where there's a very discernible threat of violence as opposed to simply you know, destruction of evidence, not that destruction of evidence isn't a concern. Right. Um, but given some of the danger of no-knock warrants as, as we've seen them play out, you know, I would I would think that some level of restriction on them, like with the, like in the federal law where they're contemplating um, precluding them in drug cases, you know, might make some good sense. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Member Albert uh, Thank you, Mr. President. I just had a few context questions, and, and thank you very much, uh, Chief Jones. The, the numbers you reported on from 2019, are those consistent over time, or is that just one year? Is, is that about what you've seen, for example, over, say, five years? Yeah. About 20% uh, of no-knock warrants, of all warrants. Right. So it's consistent over the years. I'll give you a couple other statistics. So, for example, in, we had we executed more warrants in the years of 2017 and 2018 of about 180 plus warrants in both of those years. Um, and in 2017, we did 89 no knock search warrants. Um, and um, in 2018, we did 107. Um, so, again, um, that's been consistent um, over the years. Um, you know, again, when we look at what we are starting to see is more guns on our streets, um, and we're seeing more gun cases um, involving um, individuals that uh, are in possession of illegal firearms. And so that's where we've seen this track of um, some in increase um, in, in certain cases. And, and I would note, like, in narcotics cases, we simply just don't, if there's a, a potential that people are going to, and we know that there's this exception about the uh, destruction of evidence, but if that's all our, our investigators have, we don't, we don't approve a no-knock search warrant just for the destruction of evidence. Um, our, 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 the way we function is we, we do it primarily for uh, for weapons and, and crimes of violence, as we have noted. Thank you. And I guess um, this may be a question for the state's attorney, but of, of the requests that go to the judges, how many are denied um, versus how many are actually, in fact, accepted? Do we have that statistic? Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I And I don't know if the court has a mechanism right now to capture that information. I could inquire. Um, I don't, I know that internally within the police department, what gets reported back to us 
Um, there are not a significant, I, I think I've only heard of maybe one this year that was denied, that the no knock portion was denied, but um, I don't have those firm numbers. Okay. And I guess, Chief, I, I appreciate what you're saying in terms of policies are not the same within different police departments across the country. I think that's a, that's a reasonable statement, uh, easy to accept. Um, but how subjective versus objective is that internal review? Do you have a written policy on this uh, within the department that you track and follow? Or is it more just on a case-by-case -case basis with general guidelines? What does it look like when you have to discuss this internally within your team? Right. So, so every every search warrant is for is to be reviewed by a search by a supervisor, as well as an executive officer. So, whatever the search warrant is for, whether it's for a residence, whether it's for a car, whether it's for a person or whether it's for some other type of evidence such as a, a cell phone, all search warrants are reviewed by supervisors and an executive officer before they are presented to the court. That is a, that is a process that we've had in place for, 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 for many years, um, and uh, it has been consistent. Um, so, again, and we have um, some executives, particularly in the narcotics um, uh, the drug enforcement side, who are people who we have, uh, who have uh, significant expertise um, in search warrants. Uh, we teach search warrant uh, review um, with our executives as well, um, so that they understand what are, what are the boundaries that we go by, what are our expectations. Um, that's something we do uh, often. Um, and uh, with that being said, that means that an investigator knows that they have to they have to go through an executive review um, for their search warrants before it is approved, before it can even be presented to the to the court. Okay, and I guess, and I'm sensitive to your comments about the proliferation of weapons in our community. I think we we all know, unfortunately, um, that that is true. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the safety of officers, the safety of neighbors, and the safety of other people, um, I think, is something that we have to bear in mind. I, I am distressed, of course, by the case that has been recently brought up uh, that has received a lot of media attention, correctly received a lot of media attention. Um, and, and I know that this is being looked at internally, um, but, but it's hard to ignore the facts of that case or, or as they have been stated publicly and from the perspective of the victims of that particular incident and not connect that to some of what we're seeing in other cases nationally. And so I can understand the concern and emotion uh, from a number of members of the community who already have a number of legitimate concerns of trust and, and that this is yet another example of a tool that may be important, but in this specific instance, not knowing all the facts, and I'm sure, of course, there's an investigation, it appears that on the surface, at least, it may have been abused. And so I, I think that, those, that that is weighing into my personal decision making with regards to this specific policy as well, um, balancing those two things. Uh, and, and so if, if I know it's a it's an ongoing investigation and you're probably limited in your ability to discuss that specific case, but maybe in broader terms, Chief Jones, if you can talk about or address some of the concerns, legitimate concerns that have been raised about trust issues and, and the proportionality of how we are using these tools uh, to keep the public safe. Right. So I'm a... I'm assuming I'm, I'm not sure which case you're referring to, Mr. Albano. Is it the sorry the, the case involving the firefighter from Montgomery County? Right. right, and again because it's under litigation, I can't speak to to the specifics of that case. I can tell you there's only one side of that case that the public has heard thus far, and I think it's it's really unfair in this analysis of how we are actually looking at this particular case because there's more facts to that case that would, I think, would clear the air um, in that regard. But I'll, I'll just digress from that standpoint and just talk about in general and from, from a trust factor. And when we look at the number of search warrants that our SWAT teams have served 
um, over the years, when you look at the numbers and you look at the amount of uh, uh, the low levels of, of, uh, a, of, of complaints that we receive, uh, the low levels of use of force cases that we've had in those particular services of warrants, um, I think, again, and again, I think we have one of the best well-trained SWAT teams in this area, in the country, um, based upon um, the safety mechanisms that they provide, um, not only to other officers, but to the communities, as well as the individuals that uh, we have to actually serve these warrants for. Um, so with that being said, I mean, I understand that there's always where we are in this environment right now, there's a lack of trust with police all across the country. Um, and there's the, you know, that they think that a lot of these things that are happening are, are again, we're looking at a, a small number of cases right now, um, right, you know, and again, when I look at what is our, what is our procedures versus what's another department's procedures, um, and I will tell you that uh, we are, we don't do these types of search warrants as noted um, the way that a lot of these other agencies do them outside of this area. And my final context question for now um, is, uh, um, what kind of review is conducted internally after a no-knock warrant is administered? What, what does that look like? Do, 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 does your leadership and your team look at these cases to track um, the success beyond whether or not there was an arrest? Um, but the impact to the family or community, um, what type of assessment is, is, is conducted after each of these are initiated? Well, well generally, um, the Special Operations Division uh, Director who oversees um, the, the SWAT team will do reviews and brief, uh, debriefings of incidents when they do search warrants um, uh, and other type of operations um, so that they can look at what was the impact, what, what was done correctly, and if anything, what was done incorrectly, um, and if anything was done incorrectly in order to resolve that. Um, in general, we will handle uh, most of these types of cases um, as a review. Um, it may not be each individual case. Um, if it's a no-knock warrant and everything went relatively smooth and there was, um, a, there was an arrest with no, no, no uh, incidents whatsoever, um, but there may be, you know, generally the teams are always going to review um, their, their tactics and what they're doing in order to make sure that they, again, are doing it the proper way and the most safe, safest way possible. Thank you. And, and I guess raising the threshold to, to, to use no-knock warrants, I think, is reasonable. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's in, in a case-by-case -case basis, you know, it can't be an entirely cookie cutter approach, but but I but I also think that um, we we have to balance this and, and be very cautious moving forward, acknowledging the time we are in. So, um, I'll yield back, uh, Mr. President, and and looking forward. I'm sure other of my colleagues have questions and thoughts on this too, but um, I, I will listen. I'm continuing to process this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you for let, letting me join uh, this discussion. A couple of questions in the comments. Uh, I think Chief Jones said in 2019, 108, I don't know if I got my numbers right, of 140 of the search warrants were no-knock warrants. Was that correct? Did I get that number right, Chief Jones? Uh, that's correct, yes. And and, uh, and uh, Ms. Roberts said anecdotally she's only aware from her capacity of one that was denied this year by a judge. Am I stating that correct, Ms. Roberts? That we are aware of. Right? Yeah. We are, yeah. We are aware of that. Acknowledging there might be others. Yes, of no-knock search warrant applications, correct. Great. And that would be very consistent with how they are approved across the country um, and by officers. I've spoken to officers uh, in Montgomery County and who've said, you know, you can basically, and I'm quoting, you know, you can get a, a judge will sign any warrant. And that is consistent with, because they don't have the information. They're going 100% on what is presented to them uh, by, in the document and or any additional color they're getting. Uh, and and so that, it puts them in a difficult position. And, and again, that's not law enforcement's fault, uh, you know, per se. 
it's just the reality of the situation. Um, you know, and, and this is consistent around the country. In Denver, uh, about 163 requests in one year, judges rejected only five. Um, and, uh, and sometimes even approved a no-knock warrant when one wasn't asked for. So there's a big weight, and if you, there's study after study that show that they, that's how they generally are approved. Uh, on the gun note, uh, you know, I, there was a question, something that was brought up. 40% of Americans either currently own a gun or live with someone who has a gun. That's just America. There's more guns than people here. Uh, we can talk about that culture issue, but it, it is, it's there and it's a fact. And those are legally owned guns. Um, obviously, the number is higher for illegally owned guns. We have several doctrines at play here. The Castle Doctrine, the right to defend your home, uh, that are in direct contradiction uh, to uh, no-knock warrants in some situations. Uh, and I'll give you two examples of, you know, outside of the ones that we had here in the in Montgomery County, uh, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but you know, there was the in the the uh, execution of these and how it interplays with this doctrine of you can protect your home and the castle doctrine plays out disproportionately like much of criminal justice uh, does. Uh, there's a case in uh, December of 2013 in Texas. These are both Texas cases. Uh, there's Henry, Henry McGee, who's a white man. He shot and killed a police officer who entered, entered his home on a pre-dawn no-knock warrant for drugs uh, and gun possession. Uh, there were drugs found in the home. Uh, the, he was charged with murder, Mr. McGee, who killed the officer. Uh, he argued he didn't know who the police officers were. And in February of 2014, a grand jury failed to indict him and the charges were dropped. Sim in uh, May of the same year, 2013, Marvin Guy, a black man, killed a police officer during another pre-dawn entry into, the, into his home uh, for drugs and guns. No drugs were found. Uh, he was charged with murder. He was convicted, uh, and now he's on death row. Uh, and this is in the same year, one white man, one black man, two officers killed. Uh, and I, I give that example because these no-knock warrants are not only dangerous for the residents, they're extremely dangerous for officers. And I, and I understand Chief Jones's point about the training. And, and I, again, I agree we have one of the uh, best trained and we are better than most as far as how we proceed with things, but that doesn't mean this is a good policy. Um, and so I, I want to go back to that firearm possession because this was used as a, um, in a, you know, we talked about the judge having review. I would argue that's not really a real review in the way it's currently executed. Um, and you mentioned, Chief Jones, firearm possession cases are up. Is there data on that? Because everything I've seen is that crime is down um, and so could you speak to that point that you're saying is, are you saying firearm possession numbers are up in Montgomery County? Uh, yes. And I will tell you that illegal firearm possession, we have recovered, um, on, in many of these search warrants, I think, I don't know if I've got my statistics right, but I think we've recovered somewhere over 40 weapons in this year alone off of search warrants. Um, and I'm not just talking about. Um, and there have been more guns recovered off of the street um, in Montgomery County um, from off of traffic stops um, that we've seen. And I'm talking about illegally possessed guns. Um, so we might be talking about crime is down, but that doesn't mean that we are not recovering illegal guns off of our streets um, in the same in the same vein. So so with that being said, um, I can tell you there's a serious concern that we have on our streets with our officers in patrol and in SWAT where we do these types of situ uh, uh, whether it's a traffic stop or whether it's a, uh, a search warrant. Uh, we're always being very precautious about how we actually proceed in order to make sure that our, our folks are safe um, in order to avoid any uh, dangerous injury or, or death. And you know that you're saying that though over the if I'd like to see it sounds like you don't have it and I understand that's if that's the case over the last several years because uh, how these search warrants have produced, these no-knock warrants have produced uh, the capturing of illegal guns, and yeah. has that gone and has that gone up? I just would like to, and that's okay if you don't have it, but I just yeah, we can, we can, like we, can look, we can look towards getting that information. 
wonderful. And I and I want to just correct. I misspoke a little bit earlier. Uh, Mr. Guy and, and is not on death row. He's he's still in jail six years later on a bond, four million dollar bond. But there's a possibility for the death penalty. So I just put the Kate the the uh, example still holds. Uh, the last thing I want to say uh, and ask. And point out, uh, Mr. Albanaz brought up the case of Mr. Palma, the uh, Montgomery County firefighter who had a, a no-knock search warrant executed on his home um, recently. Uh, and and while his young daughter and uh, wife were there, um, and obviously that's playing out and there's going to be litigation. And so I know you can't comment directly on that, but it speaks to a larger point of the trauma, uh, even if someone isn't killed. Uh, but the, the, the trauma and the trust that is eroded in, in these types of situations. And, and when, you, uh, if you, when you add these things together, the danger to the officer, uh, the conflicting, uh, the fact that almost every warrant is approved, uh, the potential trauma uh, and danger to the resident. Um, and I think that uh, this is not a, a, a strong uh, policy and something we need to revisit and raise the threshold. And I and I would ask the colleagues on the committee uh, to consider the First Amendment that, uh, not of the Constitution, but the first proposed amendment in the packet uh, that speaks to leaving, uh, raising the threshold. So it would prohibit the member of police force from seeking or participating in the execution of the warrant unless exigent circumstances exist. Um, and then obviously, and that would include, and the search and the search or seizure involves a reasonable suspicion of crime of violence, as was listed, and Mr. Hucker talked about that. And then also prohibit uh, from entering without knocking and announcing, uh, unless those circumstances, exigent circumstances exist, exist as well. Because you, as she points out, you want to prohibit the application of the no-knock warrant unless these ex circumstances exist, and you want to prohibit the entering under exigent circumstances unless these circumstances exist. And that would make sure that if there were, you know, if it's drugs uh, or, uh, you know, other things that are not an imminent, you know, kind of exigent circumstance where we think that these people cannot get uh, served or the search warrant cannot be served in other circumstances, that uh, they wouldn't be uh, realizing the danger of these. So um, I'll pause there. Uh, and, and yield to my colleagues. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Thank you very much. A lot has been said, Chief. Um, let me let me just ask you this, and I'm, I'm I'm really struggling with this one because when I first heard about uh, no knock warrants in terms of discussion, it was in the context of Breonna Taylor, uh, and it really was one that troubled me. And again, that's not just that's not that didn't happen here. So let me just be very clear: this is something that happened somewhere else. But what troubled me is, is that I've actually talked to officers in great detail. You know that I have a good relationship with my police officers and, you know, talk to them in great detail about procedures and tactics. Help me to understand, however, because this is my concern. Uh, five o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, a person all of a sudden busts into my home and I'm a random person, random person here in Montgomery County, but somehow, some way, folks thought that I possessed some sort of firearms illegally or drugs or whatever the case may be. Why is it the assumption that I, who you're assuming, uh, based on your information, is possessing these illegal firearms, illegal drugs, would not try and defend myself just because you decided to bust down my door? What, what, what? is the tactical sort of thought process in terms of that that would mean that me, an individual who has already violated the law by possessing these illegal firearms and illegal drugs, would then all of a sudden just lay down and say, oh, you got me, come on in and get me, versus I'm going to try and defend myself. You know, so set aside the examples that Council Member Juwando has talked about and other Council Members have talked about in terms of that, you know, maybe information is wrong, whatever the case may be, let's go to the one where it's right, to where you do have the criminal element that's there. Why is it thought that, and is there evidence that shows that folks that are in that situation typically surrender versus fight? So I, I think that the, the uh, 
where where that's uh, where that's proven is the number of search warrants that we execute, where we are able to actually in, in our tactics that we're utilizing, it's the when you do a no knock warrant, it's the element of surprise, um, and the way that we conduct in our tactics. I think the proof is the amount of success that we have with no violence whatsoever um, in the execution of the warrant um, and individuals who are arrested without incident. So if you look at the number of search warrants that we have executed, um, and again, the very limited uses of force that have to be utilized in those cases, and again, look over the years about the number of shootings that we've had as a SWAT team, three in 40 years. That speaks volumes to the tactics and the training that these officers go through consistently and daily and are able to actually go into someone's house who, again, as you say, regardless of the time of day, but let's say early in the morning where we're able to actually get, you know, into the residence um, based upon a well thought out plan um, and the way that we utilize our tactics to be able to uh, get to the individual that we may be, again, who we think might be in possession of these uh, dangerous weapons and able to secure those individuals without incident. And I think mm -hmm. those, that, that's that's what, that's where that comes from. So I appreciate that. So conversely, and, and so I'd just like to understand the other part of it. So where is the, the evidence or, or the data that shows that if we did do a regular search warrant and didn't do a no-knock that we couldn't still achieve the same outcome. Is there the same sort of thing on the other side? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. I'm not picking right. sides here. I, I just want to understand. So where is the evidence that shows that that's more dangerous and that we've actually had incidents of violence that have happened by doing a regular search warrant versus a no-knock search warrant? Is that information available? So again, it, again, if depending upon right again, a no knock search warrant again is the anticipation that an individual has has a has a history of violence or has weapons in the residence, versus will we do a, a knock and announce search warrant, right? Let's say it and it doesn't have those components connected to it, and there's a knock and announce where there's not an anticipation of of those, uh, that there might be violence associated with the individuals in which we're doing the search warrant on that particular residence. Um, so there's evidence that also shows, yeah, that we're not, that there's again, a very limited amount of, again, interactions of use of force in those cases as well. Um, but, you know, sometimes those cases, there might be a use of force just like in a um, no-knock situation, but it's very limited. So just to, and. And again, Mr. Chair, I, I just just want to put a fine point on this particular piece. So again, to understand, with no-knock warrants, you see that there's a lower propensity of violence and use of force. Um, with regular warrants, you still see a low propensity of violence or, you know, so for me, it's one of those where it could kind of go either way. Um, it seems as though there's low incidents on both sides. The question that I have is that what is the, would, would we not be able to, and I know that we have to do some uh, regular warrants for gun possession. I, I know that not every single uh, uh, gun possession or drug possession is a no-knock warrant. Is that, that correct? That's correct. Right. Right. So, so we have some of those incidents that actually happen without that. So. It's, it's, it's just one where, again, this is why it's so hard, because it seems like on both sides, the, the incidents of use of force are very rare, uh, and the ultimate of what happened in some of these egregious cases uh, may have been violation of, and I'm not you know commenting on existing cases, but could have been anything from policy not being adhered to, to whatever the case may be versus it actually being the warrant itself that is the problem. And so that's where the challenge is and just trying to understand what's the best way to go about this. And it's hard, it really is hard. Thank you very much for your very honest answers and thank you, Mr. Chair, appreciate it. Thank you. Council Member Juwando for a brief remark, please. 
Very brief. Uh, and I appreciate Councilmember Rice's line of questioning. I think it's an important point. I just will underscore that, you know, of the warrants that the chief mentioned in 2019, all the search warrants, 140, 108 were no knock. So I think the, the the vast, and he said those numbers were pretty consistent, the vast majority of, of warrants that are being sought are no-knock warrants. And I think the history of these is the Nixon era drug war. Uh, that's when they really started being used. And I think, and, and so, and because of the prevalence of guns, I think we just need to eliminate, restrict this into the most severe cases and raise the threshold. Uh, because the two cases we know about, one involved a death, in the case of Mr. Duncan Lamp, and I'm not saying it shouldn't or shouldn't have happened that way. And the other is that we is publicized. Uh, we have a traumatized family and there's others. We don't have the data on those, but I just think the risk is high uh, for everybody. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Well, uh, it, well if I could add, though, we are still we serve 600 search warrants a year, 600. And this, uh, if we're talking about you're talking about what the SWAT team serves. And that's that's a difference. So the total the total numbers of all search warrants done in Montgomery County are approximately 600 search warrants a year, and not done this way. So I just Thank want to make sure that that's that's clear. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. Did you have anything else to add? But we're going to try our best to move on on this topic, please. Um, the only thing that I that I just wanted to point out was um, to the extent that the council isn't already aware of the Maryland state law with regard to no-knock search warrants. So in 2005, and this is actually written in policy, um, Montgomery County Police do require that officers, if they are going to be, if there are circumstances that necessitate a no-knock search warrant, they actually have to present that information to a judge. Um, and so the law in 2005 changed, the criminal procedure article changed. Prior to that, judges could not issue no-knock search warrants. And now um, the law requires that judges that that information must be presented to um, a judicial officer for them to sign off on. And the exigent circumstances, uh, which come to us from Wilson and its progeny, which is a there's a number of U.S. Supreme Court cases which talk about what the different exigencies are, and the exigencies with regard to no knock warrants are threat of physical violence or um, reason to believe. That evidence is likely to be destroyed and the, the threat of physical violence is with regard to um, not just police officers but more importantly the individuals within the residence as well as individuals who are in the vicinity of wherever that search warrant is going to be conducted so um, i don't have any other information to add at this time ms roberts i didn't understand your first part uh, part though you said that in 2005 that the state law had changed is that what you said yes so um, prior to 2005, a judge was not, or a judicial officer was not authorized to sign off and grant a no-knock search warrant. It wasn't presented to them. In 2005, uh, it went into effect October of 2005, House Bill 577 authorized law enforcement officers to actually present that information to the judiciary, to the bench, and have the judges sign off on no-knock search warrants. When that law went into effect, Montgomery County Police put in place a policy that required if an officer was going to be seeking to have a search warrant um, served via a, a no-knock um, exception, that that information had to be presented to the judge at the time of the application for the actual search warrant and for that um, for the judge to make that determination. Okay, thank you very much. Um, to, to the uh, council members, at on page five of our packet, there's a recommendation for number one, or the, uh, the uh, there's there's three different uh, options that are listed. Uh, one uh, being the amendment above to, to ban no knock warrants or otherwise entering without knocking or announcing, except for certain exigent circumstances in connections with crimes of violence. Two, banning no knock warrants altogether, or three, banning any exceptions to the no knock to banning any exceptions to the knock and announce rule. I, my concern is candidly, and I and I understand the conversation, and and I appreciate the conversation. But there are times, unfortunately, even in Montgomery County, where someone has been uh, taken as a hostage or or as a has been kidnapped, and and um, I I just 
am concerned that if we say that you can't have them at all, that that would be leading ourselves, lending ourselves to a horrible situation. Because I believe Council Member Rice said that there is that there is people and I guess everybody else has said this too. But there are people who are going to break the law who have broken the law, and it's taking someone's freedom from them. And that we are trying our law enforcement officers are trying their best to bring that person back to safety. And so we need to have a now for the at least some flexibility, so that if that circumstance that horrible circumstance takes place, that we can have something that they are a lot of law enforcement officers can take care of that situation. So I think we need to have, I guess, number one of the of the options to our is the closest to what I'm suggesting. But I believe we need to have a flexibility so that in the rarest of circumstances, when there's a no knock warrant, that that there's a possibility that someone can have it. That's, that's where I am. So I'm for option one, or is with maybe some twists to it, but with option one, Council Members, Albernaz or Hucker, please let me know where you are, please. Council Member Albernaz. Sure. I agree with you, Mr. Council President. I do think, however, that this and in many other instances, the the assessment of each of these cases, which is already done internally, and the process by which the decision was made to utilize these in the first place, is something that after the fact should be made public. And there should be a review of these cases that we discuss as a council and as a body acknowledging the complexities of these individual cases. We haven't also talked about the difference between going into an apartment complexes versus a home. You know, there are a lot of existential issues that may arise that you have to be cautious of in trying to protect everyone from situations like this. So I agree with you. But I also think that this is something that that we should and in other instances as well, more formally visit each year in discussion and consultation and through transparency with law enforcement. But I agree with your assessment in terms of option one. And I agree with what you're what you've suggested to Vice President Hucker. Well, I think that's that's well said. I think we have the same goals. And I fully agree with the need for the transparency. Under your scenario, though, Mr. Chair, wouldn't a entry be permitted under the exigent circumstances exception? Those every I think everything you said qualifies as an exigent circumstance. It does. And that's what number one says. Number two says ban no knock warrants altogether. Well, going to still have the ability to use exigent circumstances exception. Is that correct, Ms. Wellens? That's correct. Although in that scenario, you wouldn't have the benefit of the judge's review. So it would have to be a situation in which the officers judged that the situation was so dire that it couldn't wait. They had to they had to act. Does that answer the question? So you're saying that a police officer would have to see that it's an imminent danger would not necessarily go to a judge or couldn't wouldn't go to a judge because under these, if we said that they're not allowed at all, then a judge couldn't grant them in Montgomery County. And am I saying that correctly? Right. Well, the Montgomery County police would not be able to seek one or participate in one. You know, I suppose that a judge, I don't know, Haley could probably answer this better. But I assuming that a judge could still grant a search warrant for some other, you know, federal agents, for example, but Montgomery County wouldn't participate. And Ms. Roberts, did you want to weigh in on that one? So I think that to answer your question best, so it would depend on the type of search warrant. So I guess a federal agent could go to a federal judge and get a search warrant that would be signed off on. But if the law was passed with that limitation, I think that it would limit Montgomery County police officers from being able to apply, whether they're acting in a task force officer position or as a Montgomery County police officer. It would not have any impact on any other jurisdictions 
in Montgomery. So, you know, it wouldn't impact Gaithersburg City or one of those other jurisdictions, but Montgomery County Police, based upon that Second Amendment, would not be allowed to um, or permitted to even apply for um, a no-knock search warrant from a judge. Okay, thank you. Council, um, Vice President Hucker, did you, had you finished? <laughs> um, I, I think so. I guess I can go along with one. I'm a little concerned about enumerating all the, but uh, that's fine, if that's the will of the committee. Can I ask a question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. It, one of the things that Ms. Hitt, Ms. Roberts mentioned, I just wanted to confirm between her and Ms. Wellens, the, exig the definition of exigent circumstances in the case law, it seemed, when you described it, Ms. Roberts, you said that the destruction of evidence was an ex had been interpreted interpreted as a as a exigent circumstance, and I just wanted to clarify that because if that's the case, I think we might want to consider not including that in, which would, that is not a crime of violence, and we don't want to leave that as as an an opportunity. I don't think the the uh, spirit of what we're trying to do here would we would want to allow a no knock search warrant in that situation. Right. So under um, Wilson v. Arkansas, which is a U.S. Supreme Court decision, um, the court talked about various circumstances of what could be considered exigency. And while there's no bright line rule of this is exigency, it's all in the case law. The Wilson and his progeny um, to present date have all consistently said that um, exigency is going to be case by case and fact specific to exactly what's occurring in any given situation. Um, destruction of evidence is one of the exigencies that has been, um, that the court has found. However, I would just note that um, for your edification in Montgomery County, um, Montgomery County Police do not, the procedure internally in the department does not allow for application for no-knock search warrant based upon a concern of destruction of evidence alone. There must be one of the other um, pieces, which in the case law also talks about one of the other exigencies is um, threat of uh, harm yeah. or loss of life. Yeah, and I, and I and I think we need to to Councilmember Almanos's point. We need to understand this more. I would suggest that we would formally codify that policy and remove destruction of evidence as a as a reason uh, for as an exigent circumstance. But also, my understanding of some of these search warrants is that if you have an illegal gun or suspicion of an illegal gun in, in uh, drugs and that, that could be destroyed. You know, in the case of uh, the Palmas, I, my understanding of that search warrant, again, uh, was that it was distribution of marijuana in an illegal gun. Uh, does that qualify as threat of violence? Because I mean, I think simply the possession of an illegal gun, maybe, maybe it does. I just, I don't know how that's being interpreted. So I just wanna raise that, that first point that I would suggest that at a minimum, we would, you, the committee would remove uh, the uh, destruction of evidence as an exigent circumstance, but I do think we need to dig deeper into that other scenario as well. Thank you. I, I uh, first of all, thank you for that, and I'm fine to to take out evidence. In fact, Chief Jones, you said that, and as Ms. Roberts has also said, you said earlier on that Montgomery County doesn't do that now, so I'm fine with that. But let me please remind uh, everyone that we should not be talking specifically about any cases that are especially those that are pending because that's not uh, it, we don't know all the information associated with it and I don't know that it's fair to all sides that when we do that so but I, I am fine with um, I am fine with the number one with the as I said with the with the uh, idea that the destruction of uh, evidence is not one of the uh, exigent uh, uh, circumstances. Is, does that meet with my colleagues, um, Councilmember Member Albert, again, Vice President Hopper? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thank you. We're moving right along now. <laughs> we're now on number two. Based on that, and we're checking, so I don't know that this is even going to be able to be possible, but call me way out there, but because the first one took an hour, my guess is that we're not going to get through this in the next hour for the next 10 of them. So I'm ho hoping I could do, if possible, I could uh, have a uh, be at a committee meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock, uh, a Zoom meeting. And, and if my uh, others, uh, uh, the other council members could do that, perhaps we can continue this tomorrow as to move this along. 
But at this point, they're checking. So we'll just check your calendars, please. I must call do that, Mr. Chair. Excuse me? I'll be in a, a, hear, a different administrative hearing at 10 o'clock tomorrow. So you cannot do it. So there goes there goes that answer. Okay. Thanks. I, I guess everybody gets a veto on that one. Okay. It was a regular um, thing. I would move it, but I can't. I, I got you. Okay. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out something else. All right. So now we're on number two, the uh, neck restraints and uh, and uh, a court court uh, court uh, restraints. Um, Ms. Wellens, did you have any explanation of that? Um, yes. Uh, thank you, President Katz. Um, so the recommendation um, associated with this item two um, neck restraints or carotid restraints. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the um, bill as currently drafted would prevent um, these restraints, which I'm going to call chokeholds for sake of um, using a single term, um, are banned unless uh, they would be justified as a use of deadly force as defined under the bill. Um, some jurisdictions have and, and I believe this might be, the chief can uh, clarify, but I believe this might be the case for Montgomery County, have as policy banned chokeholds altogether, um, not putting in that exception for when deadly force is, um, is justified. So uh, the option here would be to either maintain the current language of the bill or to um, Provide take take the chokeholds out of this section about deadly force and have a standalone section that simply bans the chokeholds altogether. Chief, would you like to speak to those to that uh, statement, please? So yeah. So in uh, December of 2002, uh, the department we published the headquarters memorandum that basically stated that officers advise that the use of the lateral vascular neck restraint, which is also known as a chokehold is now considered deadly force. We stopped utilizing that as a tool. We stopped training it in um, at, at the uh, publish of that uh, of that um, memorandum. Um, therefore, uh, the only time it could be used um, was if an officer um, had to use it in the most extreme cases of deadly force. Um, and that would be the only time that that is allowed to be able to use a chokehold in the most extreme circumstance. And that's when the okay. officer feels that his his or her life is in in uh, is in in, in danger, um, and he does or she does not have any other mechanism in order to protect themselves. Vice Pre thank you, Chief. Vice President Hawk. It, well, as I as I raised at the bill introduction, I'm I'm concerned about the exception here because I think, as we've seen in many other areas of law, it's very hard to prove the state of mind of uh, someone when they're committing an act unless they have publicly said that is their intent. Um, and I don't think any police officer is going to say um, that I ahead, ahead of time. Um, that I think my life is in danger and now I'm gonna uh, use a chokehold. If the department hasn't been training it in 18 years, um, and if this, if, if uh, the ban with this exception has been in place in New York, um, and that, that exception, or loophole, whatever you wanna call it, I don't wanna prejudge it, but you know, didn't save Eric Garner, didn't save other individuals in New York um, who were killed by chokeholds, um, if other jurisdictions have had a full ban like San Francisco, I would prefer that we just go with the, um, the absolute ban because I don't think the exception, I think the exception undercuts the goal of the, of the bill. I, I, I'm inclined to, to agree with you, but let me ask Ms. Wellens, um, or Ms. Roberts or the chief, um, in the instance of George Floyd, would, would the putting of the elbow or, or on his neck, would that be considered a chokehold? 
My understanding is certainly less. Yes, I would defer to the chief and Haley about how they interpret it, but that was certainly the intent because it was an action that was cutting off the, the blood and oxygen of Mr. Floyd. Well, the last part is true that, that, the, that, that definitely was the, the impact of it. That's not a chokehold what he was putting on Mr. Floyd. A chokehold is when you take your arm and you literally put it around the person's neck within your within your arms, right? In order to uh, then uh, to to take away, um, you know, and, and have this sort of a choking mechanism in that regard. That's a chokehold. That's that's clearly defined. Um, and so I just want to remind people, and I and I hear Mr. Hunter in all due respect, but. When an officer is in the fight of their life, and I've seen officers in the fight of their lives, um, that they don't have, their weapon has been taken away, um, and they, and I've seen officer, people that they have been fighting who are much larger than them, um, and um, at the end of the day, there's a decision that has to be made. And, you know, I don't know how many of you have ever been in a real fight, um, but I can tell you this, it, it is, it is a, it is a very scary situation for anybody, um, to have to, to do this. And there are people and there's history behind it that we know of individuals who have killed officers, um, with their own weapons and who have, who have beat them with other types of weapons, um, in the result of a fight. Um, so I think that, you know, again, we don't teach this uh, mechanism um, as a for a specific reason but again when we say exigent when we talk about in the most extreme circumstances I think you are really putting officers lives in danger um, because we can never predict um, what individuals do on any given day um, we're not you know this is this is life this is between sometimes it comes down to life and death so I just want to make that point because in law enforcement, um, again, even in a New York, in, in an NYPD policy, they ban chokeholds, but they leave that in for the most extreme circumstances that it could be used um, due to that fact. And many other departments across the country have done the same. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. Councilmember Juwanda. Thank you. I just wanted to clear up the definition of the bill. A corduroy restraint is a method of rendering a person unconscious by restricting the flow of blood to the brain by comp compressing the sides of their neck where the carotid arteries are located. That can be a leg, an arm, an elbow. Uh, so it, it can be any uh, appendage, and that is captured in this definition, uh, like the, or a knee in the case of, you know, George Floyd. Um, I, I, I do think it's important to note that I would agree. Uh, we I struggled with this in the, on the initial introduction of whether to leave the, in the exception or not. Um, and we were following uh, some similar language in the Federal Peace Act and the federal bill, which has that exception as well. But uh, I would be my suggestion to the committee, obviously, and I'll, and as it comes to full counsel, would be to to restrict uh, it in, in all circumstances as well. I, I think this case, obviously, we had an officer, Officer Morris, uh, convicted of assault for using his knee to come down on the neck head area of, uh, of a handcuffed individual. Uh, Mr. Pessoa in front of the Aspen Hill McDonald's. So this is not a theoretical exercise. Uh, later provision in this bill would restrict the striking of a restrained individual, which that was that was the case there too. Um, and so I think this is a step we need to take, even though it's not taught. I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, I have been in a real fight, probably more than I'd like, but uh, I, and I understand the life and death decisions. Uh, but these types of, uh, of of tactics under your as you've said, are not taught and are not uh, good policy. So I think we should prohibit them. That would be my recommendation to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Harper. Um, if I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just respond to the, the chief, um, with all due respect to, to, and I have great respect for you, you know that, uh, I have two, two points. One is, um, you're right. It, the, the exception is in place in New York, as I mentioned, in other jurisdictions, and I, having you know having seen the video of eric garner's killing i don't believe those officers really thought their life was in danger and yet that loophole was used um to justify um 
Eric Garner's death um, in that case, which is why I'm speaking against it being used in Montgomery County. Um, the last thing I want to do is put any officers' lives at risk. Um, I think, you know, my own grandfather was killed in the line of duty and is on the, the National Memorial downtown. Um, my family's been affected by violence against police, um, and I, I don't suggest this lightly at all. I do believe the logic of what you're suggesting um, is a little flawed because I can't believe that if I'm a police officer whose weapon was taken away and I believe that my life uh, could be saved by using a chokehold on my assailant, I would, would uh, forego using the chokehold because I don't want to be disciplined in the future. I'm going to do anything possible to save my life, whether it's use any possible hold, any possible weapon I can get my hands on anything, I would think, and worry about the disciplinary issue later. I'm going to do whatever it takes to save my life. So I don't, I can't believe a police officer is going to um, do something less than they need to do to, to protect themselves and save their lives if they truly believe they are in a life-threatening situation. The reason to take out the loophole is simply to avoid the abuse of the loophole by an officer who didn't sincerely believe their life was in danger. Thanks. Thank you. And, and to that point, um, I, I, um, I, I am too am concerned about the safety of, a, of, a, of an officer. And, and, uh, but I'm also concerned that if we're not teaching what would be the, the, the proper way, and, not, and I'm suggesting that we should not teach it, but if we're not teaching the proper way to do a uh, neck restraint, then, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a street fight and somebody's just joking each other. I mean, I, not that I, it's been a while, thank goodness, since I've been in a fist fight and, and hopefully it'll be forever again that I'm not. I mean, but, but, uh, but I am the youngest two of, uh, of three brothers, so I certainly knew what fist fights amounted to. But, but I, I believe that if we're not teaching it, then we shouldn't be doing it. And so, um, I, I'm I'm fine with the the second uh, rec the second suggestion uh, under recommendations of banning the res uh, restraints in, in all circumstances. Council Member Rice. So I just had a quick question, and maybe Ms. Roberts or Ms. Wellens can answer this because I think that the last example that you gave, Mr. President, is something that um, I've always wondered. So if an officer does something in the case of like what Chief Jones explained to where, you know, it, it's a violation of policy, but it's determined or, or could be determined by the courts that, look, this was a last resort. This was something that they had to do. Is is that, that considered, right? Is there case law surrounding someone stepping outside of policy and doing something that they can prove that, look, I, my gun was taken. I had everything this person beating the life out of me, and that's all I could do. And then is there a case law that says that a person like that didn't get prosecuted because they proved that that was all that they could do. If, if before the chief answers that, but they might no, not no, be Ms. prosecuted. Roberts. Oh, Ms. Ms. Roberts. Roberts. But before they answer that, um, I would like to know whether or not, even though they might not be prosecuted, whether or not they would be fired because they, that they didn't. I mean, that there's, right. there is that, that yes. problem as well. Uh, right. So please, yes. So um, if you're looking at criminal prosecution, and the analysis and review of whether or not an officer's actions are justified because the criminal review would be consistent with, you know, uh, criminal law, um, federal, state, constitutional law, et cetera. Um, would that potentially be a justification? Sure, it could be a justification for, for why the um, use of force was justified based upon, you know, similar to any other justification when force is used, even when it's not a police officer involved. However, when you look even further at civil law and civil context, you know, if, if we have a policy that says officers can't do X, they do it, even if they are justified, that could have um, drastic implications and, and, and an impact on whether they are protected under qualified immunity, um, any civil liability, you know, imp it, there could be potential liability on the county as a whole, on the department as a whole. So there are um, great, there could potentially be greater implications going further um, if that is written into policy. Chief, did you have any further comment or no? Okay. So, so Mr. President, if I could just comment just, just, sure. just very, very quickly. 
Um, so along those lines, many of you know that I have a, a family member who's on the force right now in a neighboring jurisdiction. And we had this conversation and he told me how he's been in what he described as hundreds of fights. And the chokehold is prohibited, it's banned since the 70s. They've, he's never used it and he's had some touch and go situations. And so I think that again, it's, it's one in which I agree, if we leave it there, it's more accepted than if we say it's banned and then we can justify in a life and death situation. And that's exactly how he described it. If it's a life and death situation, I don't have anything else left. I may go to something like that or other kinds of things. I mean, there are a whole bunch of other things that we all know in a panic mode of you saving your life, you're going to try and do fighting someone. I mean, there are all kinds of things that folks do to at the last moment of trying to, you know, get out of something and save your life that you're going to try and do. And so from that perspective, I, I just think that in those kinds of things, a court of law, a jury of reasonable people will say, I understand this is the situation. And the chief, if we're talking about disciplinary procedures, would also uh, lean towards the same sort of thing. Look, I mean, he's already said it. Look, in a life or death situation, you don't have anything else. That's what's there. And so even from a disciplinary standpoint, I believe that there's a way in which we can ensure that those kinds of things are handled appropriately. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, council member Albernaz, council member Hucker, where are we on, these, on this one? I'd prefer to remove the exception. Remove the exception, council member Albernaz. I would as well. Okay, that's a 3-0. We're moving on to use of force involving vehicles. Um, the um, uh, Ms. Wellens, did you want to go through that one? Um, yes, thank you. So this might be an issue of perhaps codifying current police written policy. Um, the current policy states that officers are prohibited from shooting at or from moving vehicles unless the circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force. Um, and this is, appears to be, you know, consistent with a number of other jurisdictions. Um, there's been some concern in recent years about individuals, you know, such as domestic terrorists, for example, using vehicles to ram into pedestrians. Um, so obviously that might be a situation in, in which the general rule of not shooting at a moving vehicle wouldn't apply. So a potential amendment to the bill would be to, again, codify that standard, prohibit a member of the police from shooting from a moving vehicle unless circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force. And then you you could just leave it there, or you could also um, add that, that the only way you would shoot at a moving vehicle was, again, if deadly force is justified and if the vehicle is being used um, as a weapon. Thank you. Chief, would you like to comment? You're on mute. I was trying to uh, get to our, um, um, you know, our deadly force policy. Um, and basically, our officers are prohibited from, first of all, even putting themselves in the path of a moving vehicle uh, where officers use of force would be the probable outcome. And when confronted by an oncoming vehicle to make sure that we move out of its path rather than fire at that vehicle. And we're also already prohibited from shooting at or from moving vehicles unless those circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force. And I think it's been well documented over the past few years, even here in the United States, that we've had domestic terrorism utilized by vehicles that have been used to ram people, um, to mow people down across this country. Um, and that's been a major concern of ours. Um, if you even pay attention to certain things that we've done over the past years from a prevention standpoint, if, you, if you've attended the uh, Silver Spring Thanksgiving Parade as an example, where we have used uh, uh, more precautionary uh, um, equipment in order to protect those who are attending 
um, the uh, actual parade and the participants. Um, and that is for a reason. Um, and so there's, you know, again, um, we can't, uh, I, I would just hope that this committee would not forget about things that have been happening in this country with domestic terrorism, um, that people are utilizing vehicles to mow uh, people down um, in, in such a way. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. I, I think we do have to keep in mind that um, as, as unbelievable as it was, we do have Charlottesville, Virginia to think about. We have people that that uh, have gone out of their way to, to kill other people uh, by using their car. So they use their car as a weapon. They didn't. So I, I think we have to there again uh, allow for the possibility if a police officer sees that horrible circumstance that they can shoot at the tires or whatever they're shooting at to to uh, to uh, avoid having people lose their lives. But I, I do believe that it's I, I, I think on the recommendations itself, uh, there's number one and number two and number three. The, the first one is kind of find current uh, Montgomery County policy, uh, Montgomery County Police Department policy, uh, which they described above. The second one is not addressing moving vehicles within the bill. I do believe we should address it. And the third is modifying current uh, police policy regarding moving vehicles as the option uh, is described above. And that's, and the options described above is, um, would be to prohibit a member of the police from shooting from a moving vehicle unless circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force and prohibit a member of the police force from shooting in a moving vehicle unless the vehicle is being used as a weapon and the circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force. I, I, I believe the, the second part of that, to prohibit a member of the police from shooting in a moving vehicle unless the vehicle is being used as a weapon and the circumstances would authorize the use of deadly force is, the, is a reasonable standard. So um, my colleagues, where are you on this one? Uh, I agree, Mr. Council President. I, I do too. Okay. Better than not addressing the issue. And and Mr. President, if I could just also just note that we are going to deal with this later. But presuming one of the major tenets of the bill is elevating the standard of when deadly force can be used in and of itself, and that would encapsulate this. So I think that's another potential protection. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. Thank you. Next is uh, number four. Uh, the striking restrained individuals, uh, Ms. Wilkins. So the uh, bill as drafted um, prohibits the striking of restrained individuals and uh, council member Jawanda, who can of course um, speak for himself, but suggested that there be a definition of striking. So there's a proposed definition here on page seven of the packet. In addition, the office of the county attorney um, Brought, has brought to your attention the, this uh, situation. There was a case, Elliot v. Levitt, um, in the Fourth Circuit. And although the circumstances would be extremely rare, uh, this was a case in which an individual was handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. Uh, nonetheless, he, the individual had a handgun that he pointed at police, and then he refused to put it down. And um, in that case, deadly force was justified, notwithstanding that the individual was handcuffed. So the county attorney's office is suggesting that the bill also define restrained as indicating that the person is under control. Um, and I don't know that uh, one, so that as they've described it, restrained individual would be an individual who is under control, is not resisting arrest, and no longer poses a threat to the officer. Um, or others in the immediate area. Um, and I didn't include this in the packet, but I would suggest one option would be a modification on this wording that you could say a restrained individual is an individual um, who is uh, who is handcuffed and unarmed would make it a little more specific, or you could certainly go with the county attorney's uh, definition, which is just you know a little bit broader than that. Um, I think that's it. So it's just a matter of whether and how to define these specific terms. Okay, Councilmember Jamondo, did you want to speak? Yes, on? just wanted to explain. Uh, you know, striking. We use the definition of like a definition of, and it's not defined in current county codes. So we just use the kind of the Webster's definition of striking, which I think is 
commonly understood and it's been interpreted in case law as well, but just wanted to be specific. And then on the second point, uh, I would suggest uh, that I think the Office of the County Attorney's definition of under control is too broad um, uh, of, you know, of restrained individual rather is too broad. Uh, so I, in long in lines with what Ms. Wellen said, uh, you know, I think saying an individual who is handcuffed, you know, uh, restrained um, and uh, and unarmed uh, would be a better definition. I think adding the not resisting arrest and no longer posing a threat, those are those are pretty broad and subjective uh, determinations by the officer, which I think would be a big loophole to the general policy goal, which is not to have someone who is restrained uh, face down uh, on the ground, for example, being being struck. Uh, so I, that, that would just be my suggestion to the committee. Okay. Um, Jake, did you want to speak to this one, please? So, so yeah, so, um, I mean, in regards to like Mr. Duando's last statement, um, I mean, to me, that's, that's pretty clear cut that when you have someone already um, handcuffed down on the ground, not actively resisting, um, that, that an individual would be struck. That's correct. Uh, but I think that, um, and again, I fully understand the intent of this part of the, uh, um, legislation, but this uh the the word restrain still to me is very it's it's not really clearly defined um and i'll give you an example um some examples of this uh where we've had individuals who've actually been in handcuffs and who have escaped or who have actually killed a police officer um so in may of 2020 we had uh, um uh, a uh, a uh i'm sorry was capable of killing a police officer we had a man arrested in, in, in Washington, D.C., uh, despite being handcuffed, was able to retrieve a, a handgun from his waistband that was secreted and was still able to shoot a, a, a District of Columbia police officer who was arresting him. I might also remind this committee, or well, I shouldn't say remind, or inform this committee that in 2010, um, our major crimes detectives arrested an individual who had raped a young woman down at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park um, on, for first degree rape. Um, when we pulled into headquarters with that individual in the vehicle, uh, despite him being in handcuffs, he was able to unbuckle his seatbelt, open the car door, and attempt to flee uh, before actually being restrained by detectives. Um, so I think we have to leave, and this is not the first case that that's ever happened. I remember an individual who was under arrest for murder being transported down to seven lots on 270 who was able to do the same thing and actually uh, uh, bail out of a car while it was moving um, out of a detective's car. Um, and again, um, someone who was on, wasn't armed but who was in our community deemed to be dangerous. So there has to be some language that allows for an officer to actually have to be able to utilize you know, the lowest level of force, but you might have to, for example, tackle an individual who has escaped in handcuffs in order to detain them, um, depending upon the circumstances. There are, there are lots of different circumstances. So I just wanted to bring that, that uh, and also to remind people that a handcuff subject can still kick, uh, can still bite or disarm an officer, um, um, even though these are extreme circumstances. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure that those are also noted and not just uh, sort of a, in a vacuum of just individuals who are maybe compliant and that an officer shouldn't. That, that's already against our policy, an officer striking an individual who's actually handcuffed um, without even resisting or, at all. So I just wanted to make, a, make that point. Thank you, thank you Chief. I, and I, too, have heard of circumstances like that in Montgomery County uh, where, where someone has been able to take, get their handcuffs from behind their back and move them to the to their you know, to the front of them, and it, it really seems to be a difficult thing for somebody to do. But there's and instances have been known that that happens, and so therefore there has to be some ability that a police officer can put that person back as a uh, uh, to be uh, uh, handcuffed again in the proper fashion, and 
And, but I do believe by the definition of, of, and, and if you would please look at the definition from the county attorney that is saying who is under control and is not resisting arrest. So if someone is kicking at a police officer, then they're certainly, uh, um, uh, uh, not under control. Um, whether or not that would satisfy what your, what your concerns are. It no longer poses a threat. Excuse me. And, and also the no longer poses a threat in the no case longer poses a threat, in right. gun or something like that. Obviously that individual still poses a threat and wouldn't be considered a restrained individual. Chief, would that meet with the, uh, su with the uh, suggestion from the uh, county attorney, would that meet the concerns that you were just uh, discussing? Yeah, and I'll, I'll defer to, to uh, Ms. Roberts to let her weigh in on this as well. Okay. Ms. Roberts, please. Um, obviously, um, I support my office's proposed amendment. I think that that would cover those circumstances that do occur um, where officers would need to use force in situations. Um, and it would, I think, also, if uh, taking the intent from Councilmember Jawando and what Ms. Wellen said, I think it would cover uh, the intent behind that language as well and still have it restricted but allow for officers in those um, circumstances that do arise. Um, so I am for what the county attorney is suggesting. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz and Councilmember Hucker, yes, your hand came up first. Yes, I, his thumb came up. So Councilmember Hucker's in. I, I am too. I, I, I think the definition covers the concerns raised by the very reasonable concerns raised by Chief Jones um, under that provision. Okay. Mr. President, can yeah. I just, I, I, I understand you're going to take the vote. I just want to just briefly, I, 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 I worry that this is, I'm going to probably want to revisit this in full council. I, I, I think it's too broad as defined. And, and I just want to note that Ms. Wellens did suggest a, an alternative to this uh, OCA amendment because I think the way I'm reading this of an individual is under control, not resisting arrest and no longer poses a threat to the officer or others in the immediate area. Um, again, those are subjective judgments. And if an officer says, I think this person, even though they're handcuffed and sitting on the cur you know, I, you could, you could make an argument that they would say that I still think they're posing a threat. So I, I just think it's a little too broad, uh, to our previous conversation, but obviously the committee will take its action. I just wanted to point, point that out that, uh, I have that concern. Well, and as you know, all of our officers wear body worn cameras. So uh, there, there certainly is, is uh, an ability to see whether or not they were posing a threat or not. I, I don't know how you could avoid, well, I, it, the, the vote was a 3-0 for what the, uh, the office of the county attorney has, has uh, suggested. Next is number four, and uh, that's to determine, uh, uh, number five, huh? number five. And that's the use of force against a fleeing individual. Uh, Ms. Wellens, please. Yes, so um, under the bill as drafted, um, the use of deadly force against anyone, including any fleeing individual, would be permissible only if those items listed uh, there under number five, A, B, and C are met. So the force is necessary, the force creates no substantial risk of injury to a third person, and reasonable alternatives um, have been exhausted. Um, so there's the question of if the, it, but, you know, fleeing individuals, you know, kind of pose their own particular circumstance. So if the committee wishes to uh, separately and specifically address the issue of fleeing persons, um, it could do so in a way that's similar to what California has done. That's where I borrowed some of this language from a bill that they passed in California in 2019, so that you would prohibit a member of the police from using deadly force against a fleeing person unless those those items A, B, and C are the same about necessity and exhausting alternatives. But then there's an added D that the individual who's fleeing, that there's reasonable suspicion that they, that they um, committed a felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury. Chief, your comments, please. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, I'm going to yield to Ms. Roberts. I have no comments on, on this particular uh, section. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, please. Um, thank you. The only thing I would add is um, the terminology that California used, one of the comments that they had made 
was that they didn't fully define necessary. They um, ultimately kind of left it with some, we'll leave this up to the courts. Um, I think that uh, the, the concern just would be, as you know, was articulated in, uh, by my office in the memorandum submitted to the council, just ensuring that there is, um, that the language is, you know, consistent, doesn't create some sort of civil or criminal um, liability issues going forward um, and, and allows for officers to have an understanding of what the standard is. Do we need to have a definition of the word necessary in? We, we do. We do. We do. I think, and I, 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 yeah, so that would take care of that then. And all four, all four of these elements are, would have to be met, correct? Of A, B, C, and D. Yes. I, I'm, I, I believe I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I don't know where anybody else is, but I, I'm com comfortable with that. Uh, Council Member Albernaz, Council Member Hawker. I am too. Council yes, Member Hawker. Yes, sir. Very good. So we are going to go with the um, with the four criteria there. Okay, we're up to number six: treatment of certain populations, including individuals with disabilities. Ms. Wellens. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. President. So this, um, as you know, the bill is currently drafted, um, it has some general propositions about the fact that the use of force policy should, among other things, protect certain vulnerable populations without regard to sex, um, populations including persons with limited English proficiency. Um, and Council Member Jawando has suggested adding to this list um, the following, individuals without regard to race and persons with mental or behavioral disabilities or impairments. In addition, um, Council Member Juwando has suggested requiring that um, the chief uh, simultaneously with issuing the, uh, the amended use of force policy, but also after constant consultation with impacted persons and other interested groups, issue some written guidelines about um, police interactions with vulnerable populations um, and how the law enforcement officer would assess whether the use of force is appropriate and necessary uh, when interacting with these certain with these certain populations including pregnant individuals elderly persons and the and the other groups mentioned um, so I think that sums it up I don't know if council member Jawando wants to further explain and I, I will just add that this is also um, similar to a, a language used in the in the Federal Peace Act. Thank you, Council Member Jawanda. Yes, Ms. Wellens, uh, as with the packet, did a great job explaining, so I'll just be very brief. Uh, this is just uh, race was inadvertently left out uh, in the uh, first uh, iteration of the bill. Um, and just to, that's that First Amendment to race and, and individual in persons with mental or behavioral disabilities or impairments. Obviously, we've had a lot of discussion about, and we'll talk later about an item to limit police interaction uh, with folks who are experiencing mental illness. Uh, and so we wanted to list that, uh, those populations. And then the second part, cons consistent with the Federal Peace Act, uh, which uh, is part of the federal legislation being considered around this is that the police advisory commission the uh, impacted persons members of these communities these uh, vulnerable populations uh, and representatives of civil and human rights organizations would, would work with uh, the police chief to issue guidance around uh, how we uh, to appropriately address and use the least amount of force or no force at all in dealing with these populations and those guidelines would need to come out and would be accompanying the, uh, the the new use of force policy that would be created. So that that's the goal here. Thank you, Chief. Let me ask you, Chief, as, as you begin to give us your thoughts on this. In some cases, it, it, you would not know this until after the fact. I mean, you might not be able to look at someone and tell whether they're pregnant or or their age or or you know whether they're 21 or 22 or so. It would be after the fact, and you might not have meant to. You know, you know what I'm saying on this. So uh, would you like to comment on that as well? So yeah, I know exactly what you're saying, and I and I think it just overall goes to 
Um, again, in any given situation, an officer has to make, um, you know, again, a decision um, on the utilizing the least amount of force necessary in any given situation that involves the person that you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with someone, whether it's their age, whether it's, you know, whether it's their race, whether it's that you can tell that they are suffering from some sort of, um, you know, that they might be, uh, um, you know, intoxicated, um, that they might be under uh, the, uh, you know, the hallucinogen such as PCP, which we've seen an incredible um, increase that's come back on our streets um, and who are violent individuals um, when they are utilizing this type of drug. Um, and so um, because they're hallucinating and, um, and so we have to, again, but no matter what, the, 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 the standard is still, we're still utilizing the least amount of force necessary, um, given the information that you have um, at the time, that, what you know, what, what, is, what does the officer know? Um, and that's always going to be the gauge that uh, we would always um, utilize as well, um, given the circumstances. So it, it, would I be correct in saying that certainly the, 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 um, the uh, people listed on this list, but Montgomery County police officers should use the least amount of force that is appropriate and necessary whether they're on this list or not, whether at, I mean, all, you should, at all times, at all times, right. right? At all times, that's correct. That's that's the that's the standard uh, that in the use of force policy. Period. It's it doesn't it doesn't matter. It's always that you utilize the least amount of force necessary in any given situation. Um, so that's that's the standard, regardless of its whether it's race, whether it's you know a, a mental disability. It doesn't matter. I could, if I could just chat, yeah. I don't want to get in front of colleagues if they have something to say, but I, I would just say that the, the difference here, while of, of course we want that to be the case in every situation, this specifically says that there are certain populations for whom additional guidelines and considerations should be made. Um, and, and obviously if you're not going to always know if, you know, I've, Gabe and I know we have four children, you know, when our wives are one month pregnant, Councilman Rice, you know, we all have kids. You, you can't always. Uh, my, I, my wife was yes. I have some yes, children yes. too. But You're right. Every, everyone on here. Um, yes, it's not. <laughs> you know, so you can't always tell. But 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 the point is, is that there are guidelines that are used to accompany this that are developed with community input. Again, this is about co-production of public safety. You bring people from these communities together to help develop these guidelines with the chief, and then they are used in the training and enforced and in, in, of this new policy. I think that's a big difference from saying like we teach everyone to use the least amount of force possible. This is saying we recognize there are vulnerable populations and uh, we want to make sure we have a set of additional guidance that goes along with our general policy and and that's developed with the community. And, and so this, I don't think it's in conflict with anything that's been said. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear and that was the intent here. Well, I, I think perhaps we do need to to um, add the words when interacting with everyone, or however it would be worded, especially with the the list of, of that that's on this uh, page nine, because I, I do believe that we should be, and I know that our, our police officers should be and, and do use the least amount of force necessary with everyone, especially uh, to to the to list involved. So um, I, I think that is something that could be. Thought of, we could think about adding. Council Member Zalbernaz or Hucker, where are you on this? I, I think that's a, a reasonable approach, uh, Mr. President. I, I think, as Chief said, this is true of uh, how we're trying to police our entire community, but you know, they're, to take special precautions within individuals that are disproportionately at risk or vulnerable makes sense. Um, and so I, I think this is in, in adhering with the spirit of what MCPD has been enacting for decades. Uh, this just puts in writing what has been in practice that I've experienced uh, and, and have, have personally observed and just solidifies it uh, in, in a way that I think is reasonable and tangible and speaks to the moment that we're currently in in our country right now. It just, it just puts in writing what we've been doing. Uh, and I don't think, I think that's reasonable. Thanks. Councilmember Hucker. 
I agree. Okay, so, um, Ms. Wellens, did you, you're going to have to wordsmith what I said, and it, obviously you're much better at wordsmithing than I am, so, but, but you know the, the, the idea behind this. Right. Yeah, Mr. President, and I think it would just be a matter of under that subsection two on page seven, just adding, you know, where it says when interacting with colon, and then it lists those groups. It could say instead when interacting with all individuals, including colon, those those particular groups. Okay, Councilmember Juando, did you have a comment on that, or no? You're okay. Okay, good. All right, so we're moving right along, but we're still not going to get finished this. I have a feeling. <laughs> Um, next is the um, the effects on uh, number seven, effects on criminal and civil liability. Um, and Ms. Wellens, would you like to explain that one to us, please? Um, I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> so, as you know, this is a complicated issue. Um, as the bill is originally drafted, uh, there is a provision indicating that the policy directive that the chief will be establishing under this bill must not be construed to alter standards of some civil or criminal liability. And the intent there was really to acknowledge what I think is just the state of the law anyway, which is that, you know, we as the county are not trying to, and nor can we change standards of, you know, constitutional torts. We're not trying to change the standard of the Fourth Amendment. And we are not, as part of this bill, making changes to any criminal code. Um, so, but, but I think that also sort of begged the question of, well, are you saying this can't, you know, that this policy can't be used as evidence? Um, so there are two aspects for the committee to consider. One is that, um, the committee might wish to amend this section to include the statement that the policy directive, in addition to not affecting the standards of liability, must not be construed to alter state or federal rules of evidence which I, again, I think is the case anyway, but probably wouldn't hurt to clarify it, especially since we are addressing the issue of the bill. The other issue is that the Office of the County Attorney has recommended adding language, uh, sort of further beefing up this idea that we're not trying to create a new cause of action here. So the language uh, the County Attorney has suggested is this section does not create private rights enforceable by any person or individual. So I guess the question for the committee is whether you wish to adopt uh, one or both or none of those amendments described under item seven. Okay, Chief, did you have a comment? I'll defer to uh, Ms. Roberts on, on this uh, opinion. Ms. Roberts, please, thank you. She's muted. Yeah. Here Thank we go. You. Um, yeah. As is outlined in the county attorney's memorandum um, on this issue that was presented, one of the concerns, of course, is that some of the language contained within the proposed bill um, is more restrictive on its face than what the, the um, Fourth Amendment terminology is at this point in time. So, for instance, for the, uh, um, the federal... Uh, statutory law, Graham v. Connor, Tennessee v. Garner, et cetera, talks about objectively reasonable standards. And in the um, proposed bill, there is terminology which talks about, you know, uh, deadly force um, being utilized only when it's necessary as a last resort, um, et cetera. And the, one of the concerns here is um, ensuring that the policy that, that the policy that is written based upon this law does not therefore create a situation in which um, Montgomery County police officers are therefore held to a different standard outside of what the fourth um, circuit and the U.S. courts, the U.S. federal courts as well as state courts have created for criminal liability and civil liability standards. And again, even though in a criminal context, there may be, um, you know, there is, Howard County does their review of our officer, um, of our, um, you know, officer deadly use of force situations. Um, and then Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office also does review. So there's, you know, of course they do their review and will determine is it justified, is it not justified? In a criminal context, you have a number of sort of defenses that could make a situation justified. In a civil context, when it comes to whether or not 
an officer is entitled to qualified immunity or one of the other defenses, the policy very well, and they do almost 100% of the time, end up coming into play in those civil cases to show that an officer did violate policy or, you know, to be used against the county saying that the county violated the policy. So the concern from my office just is in ensuring that this isn't somehow creating a private cause of action that could result in, you know, additional lawsuits and additional liability placed upon the county. So to sum that up, are you in favor of both of the suggestions of the county attorney, or are you in favor of one or the other or none? Could you please? Oh, I'm in favor of both of the suggestions of the county attorney. I think that they were, when drafting them, we were kind of looking at it to see potential options that could be presented to the council. So I myself am in favor of both of them, and I know that my office is in favor of both of them. Thank you. Council Member Juwanda. You're on mute. Ms. Roberts, it's contagious, the mute. Yeah, I just wanted to say briefly here, and I'll put my lawyer hat on for a second. I agree this was not intended to create a new private right of action civilly. However, I do think it's important to note, as Ms. Roberts alluded to, that by raising the standard of when the use of deadly force is authorized from reasonableness to necessary and making it a stricter standard, that that evidence of violation of that policy could be used in a civil case to prove, to rebut a claim of qualified immunity, which has obviously been discussed. Obviously, for the public, that means that officers cannot be personal liable for their actions, and the county or the state has to pay if they're found liable, and or negligence. And I think it is relevant, as Ms. Roberts stated, that the violation of this policy of the raised standard could be used as evidence in those cases, while it doesn't in and of itself create a new private right of action. And I think that's the right balance. It shouldn't create a new private right of action, but we should make it clear that the evidence of violation of this policy could be used in a civil case for those purposes. So, Ms. Welch, you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I agree with everything you said, but just, if I may, I wanted to clarify for the committee that the county attorney had recommended the language regarding not creating a private right of action. The language regarding evidence was a suggestion that I made. So, I just wanted that to be clear that the evidence one wasn't, that the county attorney's office, as I understand it, was saying, we want the existing language in the bill plus this new language about private rights of action, as opposed to the evidence language. That was all. I just wanted to make sure that the committee members understood that. And I appreciate that clarification. I'm in favor of what you just said. The existing language plus the county attorney's suggestions as well. Councilmember Albernaz, Councilmember Hawker, where are you? I hear you. Okay. Very good. So, and Mr. President, I'm sorry, but to make sure that I reflect this correctly. So, are you saying you don't want the language about rules of evidence? You just want the language about private right of action? Or do you want both? I think the rules of evidence should be in as well. I support both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I thought that is what I was saying. But anyhow, okay. Yeah. Sorry. And you're okay with that too, Councilmember Hawker? Yes. Everybody, all five of us are okay on that. Okay. Next, number eight is less lethal force. Ms. Wellens, please. So, as drafted, the bill is focused on the issue of deadly force, you know, in addition to a few other issues, but doesn't specifically address the issue of less lethal force. So, the issue under number eight here, page 10 of the memo, is whether the committee would like to address the use of less lethal force under the bill by, first of all, defining it, the proposed definition. And it is defined under current police policy, by the way, and this would be a similar definition, but the definition proposed here would be any degree of force that is not likely to have lethal effect. And in addition, 
the suggested amendment by council member Gerando would, would add that this use of force policy would prohibit any less lethal force unless the force is necessary and proportional in order to effectuate an arrest of a person who the officer has probable cause to believe has committed a criminal offense and only after exhausting alternatives to the use of force. So I think the issue to point out here is that to make clear that this would be a standard that exceeds the constitutional minimum as Ms. Roberts was describing earlier, just in terms of, okay, any use of force, you need to kind of exhaust the less forceful alternatives before using it and the idea that the force would be proportional to the situation. So I don't know. I would certainly be interested if the, well, I'll leave it to you, Mr. President. I would be interested in what the police department's reaction. I think in some ways it's similar to their current policy, but it does, again, kind of go a bit above the constitutional minimum. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, would you like to comment on this? Let's see. So with this, I think there definitely needs to be, I would refer to Ms. Roberts on some constitutional issues in regards to, I guess, the recommended policy. I think that there, when we talk about less lethal, one of the less lethal weapons that's out there that we deploy is, for example, the taser, also known as the electronic control weapon. We use it as a lethal weapon, but we also recognize that it can cause death or serious injury and that each individual cycle of a taser must be separately articulable. For example, we know that just because an individual sometimes will shoot a taser or an officer does not mean that that actual tasing took effect. So therefore, the officer could reasonably articulate that he would have to utilize that taser again. But there's also this conundrum if you conflate it to that weapon as a potentially a deadly force, that could cause unintended consequences because people in our community can have a taser. It's not considered a deadly weapon, and we shouldn't make sure that nothing in this particular section would say that this is a deadly weapon. And I'll refer to Ms. Roberts on some additional language in regards to the definition of deadly force. Ms. Roberts, please. Thank you. So in looking at the proposed language, one of the concerns from a legal perspective is the exhaustion of alternatives to the use of such force. In the current jurisprudence as relates to use of force, about a decade ago, we did have what most people would be familiar with is a continuum of the use of force. And continuums were the courts moved away from them and police departments moved away from them because what was found is when you operate on a continuum, that actually led to increased uses of force. Officers were, and that led to more deadly situations because what the court has found, and if you look at the Graham v. Conner factors, it looks at the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or others, and are they actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight. And the courts have very narrowly looked in at what was occurring in that moment in time and what was it objectively reasonable, what the officer, the decision that the officer made, the use of force that they made at that point in time. And what the courts have gone even further to say is whether there is a less lethal force option available is not the standard upon which you review a use of force. It's whether the use of force itself was objectively reasonable. And I think the concern here with the current proposed language is that it's more restrictive and goes beyond what the courts have already reviewed and will in many, could potentially put us back in that situation of a use of force continuum, which has been found to not be the best practice across the country and which 
courts and, and jurisdictions have moved away from. So I think with regard to this one, the concern um, from my office um, has been that it is it goes beyond what the current constitutional standards are and could potentially create a situation in which um, from a civil liability perspective, um, we're back in that 2020 hindsight, which the courts have said is not the scope upon which you review officer use of force. So we don't look at officer use of force um, from what we know after the fact, it's what was known at the time and whether or not that use of force was in and of itself objectively reasonable. Um, so that would be the concern from the county attorney's office with regard to this proposed language. Thank you. I see that Susan Farag, who's the analyst that works with uh, the Public Safety Committee on a usual basis. Did you have any comments, Susan? Um, just briefly, I wanted to mention that the, depart the police department about four years ago in 2016 had commissioned an independent consultant to review the use of tasers within the department. And that consultant found that um, they use it, the taser is not the go-to weapon for MCPD officers. And in fact, they use much lower force most of the time. Um, it, it did mention, however, that they're worried that if tasers are not allowed or if they're classified as a deadly force, it may discourage police from using it at all in a situation that truly warrants repeated discharges and going instead to higher levels of force. Of course, the intent is always to use lower levels of force, but that's not always possible. Um, so it indicated that the taser was an appropriate um, measure to be used to try to contain and detain a suspect in, a, in any particular incident. I do want to mention that officers who are allowed to carry tasers have attended the 40 hours of crisis intervention training. They also are tased as part of that training. That allows them to understand just exactly what a taser can do to other people, whether it can disable them or not. And it also makes them understand the amount of incredible pain that a taser inflicts. Um, the last published use of force, the most recent one for MCPD officers is um, indicates that tasers were used a total of 45 times in 2018. Okay, thank you. Uh, council member Hucker. Um, well, lucky for me, Susan said it all uh, very, very well, what I was about to say. Um, and happy birthday week, Susan. Um, <laughs> The, That's one day late, but anyhow, go ahead. It was a uh, week, week, to be clear. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I, um, you're, you're correct. Right. Um, I, I would have been here for a work session yesterday, Mr. Chairman. Um, so, okay. uh, yeah, no, Su Susan, as Susan said, I remember very, I don't remember every hearing, but I remember very well the um, hearing and uh, the briefing we had after the death of, of the gentleman um, due to a taser in Germantown and the review that happened uh, subsequent to that and the recommendations. Um, and I, I would um, agree, to, to me, I, I would just uh, remove tasers from this list. We have a, a detailed taser policy. Um, it's been very thoroughly thought out. It may need a tweak or two to update it, um, but um, I would not want an officer, uh, to, to me, when all the officers were, if I remember correctly, were, tasers were removed um, following the death of the individual in Germantown, um, we had that review. Um, there is a not only additional training, but um, a new generation of less lethal, safer, quote unquote, tasers um, that are available now to our officers. Um, and I would not want to unintentionally create a situation where an officer, because of the reference to multiple uses, um, what I know about tasers are they're they're, they're hard to administer, right? You need, you need multiple points of contact. Um, they're not really useful for a moving individual. Um, and uh, they don't always, it's not always gonna be effective the first time. And I would not want to unintentionally create the situation where a police officer um, who uses their taser in an attempt to use a less lethal uh, 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 option, um, if it didn't work the first time because of the administration of it or anything else, only has the option of going then to his gun. Um, I don't think that's the intent of the, the bill. So I think we should probably leave tasers out of this and then look separately if we need to update our taser policy. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we continue, um, Councilmember Auburn, yes, you, everybody's just moved on my screen. I can't figure out where you're going. Um, 
we are supposed to have started six minutes ago for the joint committee for HHS and public safety. Does it meet with your approval that we push that back and for another 20 minutes or so to see if we if we can get through today? It does. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Council member Juando, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and yes, and just on the taser point, which uh, is not, uh, I don't think we directly mentioned, no, we don't, uh, tasers here. Uh, but I understand the, the point and uh, agree with uh, the concern about the definition on that point. I will say to uh, just something that was brought up by Ms. Roberts, the Yes, the, the intent of the bill overall and, and specifically here is to raise the standard to be more stricter around the use of force, both deadly and less lethal uh, than the constitutional standard in case law. I mean, that's the point of the bill. So I, I understand that you're stating that that's a concern of OCA, but that is the, the goal of the bill uh, to do that. And, uh, and I think so I just want to make sure my colleagues, you know, understand that. Uh, and, and, all, and also, I think the goal also is consistent with what we're hearing being stated by the chief and by Ms. Roberts, that the goal is to use the amount of less lethal force. But the question is, is what the goal is and what the standard is. And those are two different things. And, and we want the standard to be consistent with what I would agree many of our officers are, att are attempting to do. Uh, using de-escalation tactics, things that are in this bill that uh, creating time, space, and distance, using deadly force only as a last resort and only when necessary. But we want the standard to be on par with that so that the accountability, the training, uh, and everything that goes around the development of a standard uh, can be uh, consistent. So I just wanted to make that point, and that's why I think it's important. Similar to what we've done with the definitions around deadly force, and the raising of that standard from reasonableness, which is the current case law standard, which is a very old standard, which has been reaffirmed um, and would be changed in the federal law that's being considered as well. I think we want to go above that and for our officers. Uh, so that's, I just want to make that point. Thank you, Councilmember Rice. Thank you very much. I'm just going to be very brief again. Um, in, in the case in which uh, Councilmember Hucker mentioned, it was actually technically Gaithersburg. It was Montgomery Village. Uh, where the incident happened, still in my district, though, and, and, and one in which uh, I was very in tune to the situation. But I will tell you this, I've actually been on a ride along where I saw a person right in front of me tased, uh, who was resisting arrest. And thank God that they tased him instead of shot him. Uh, the man was just fine. Uh, five minutes later, as he sat on the uh, sidewalk, who was a convicted felon who had just gotten out, he was actually casing uh, an establishment that he had already previously robbed not that long ago. Um, and so I saw directly where use of less lethal force was there while he was resisting arrest. I mean, I saw the whole thing play out in front of my eyes. And so this is where it's really important for us and a key tenet of this and the whole spirit of what Council Member Juwando, Council Member uh, Albernos, and Council Member Navarro, and all of us as council members really want to make sure that everything is in the officer's toolbox, which is the use of less deadly force to ensure that there are options that are provided to them that allow for them to get a situation under control without having to kill someone. And, 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 and so I just want to be very clear about that because that's what the impetus for me uh, working with Council Member Juwando on this bill and with my colleagues on this bill is about. It's about really providing all kinds of other options that are out there uh, so that if, if there's a case of a person who's resisting, um, we have other methods in which we can do this that don't end up with the individual dying and end up with the individual being apprehended. And so I just I just really want to say thank you. And also um, really to the chief, also to let you know that yes, there are instances where uh, this is deployed and you have positive outcomes. I saw it uh, and one in which the case was handled exactly the way it should. Uh, there wasn't any extra or additional or any of those kinds of things. And that is important, right? That's an important story. Now, will there be instances where unfortunately, when we don't know the health conditions of a person, where there may be adverse reactions, absolutely. And that happens for anything. I mean, you can use pepper spray and a person could be, you know, uh, severe asthmatic and end up passing away from an asthmatic attack. I mean, so there are all different kinds of things where you just don't know the situation, but we have to try and provide every single 
uh, tool in the toolbox that provides less lethal deadly force if we want to reduce deadly force. So thank you guys. And, and I agree with exactly what you've said. And of course, that's the reason that they come out with, with uh, weaponry like this so that somebody didn't take a billy club and, and hit somebody with it. This this has changed that uh, in, in policing. And I think it should also be noted that over the years, and Chief, I, I know you'll remember this, that, that a taser has changed over the years as well. They've since, there was a time, I think, that you could hold the taser and, and, and it could go keep going and where that would have caused a death or, 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 or severe problems. Um, and, and they've since changed it so that it cuts off um, after, I don't know, seven seconds or whatever, five seconds, whatever, right. five five seconds, seconds. whatever the number is. Right. So over the years, this has changed as well. Um, and, and of course, there again, the whole idea is that people would be safe and that our officers will remain safe during those horrible moments when it's literally seconds matter of whether someone lives or not. So, that's, that's uh, right. um, and, and as, as far as that goes, um, I am fine with the suggestions that uh, Council Member Hucker has come up with. And uh, so that's where I am on this. And Council Member Hucker, I have a feeling you're in agreement with what you said. So <laughs> you're on mute. I still am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And Council Member Albernaz. I agree as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, if I could just yes. clarify to make sure again that I uh, translate this correctly. So you are recommending the amendment that's described under item eight of the memo, but also changing the definition of deadly force to exclude any reference to the tasers. That is correct. Council Member Hawker, is that a fair, fair statement? I think that's a perfect summary of the intent. Okay, thank you. And Council Member Robert, as you agree with that as well. <laughs> good, good. I've had a feeling you'd jump in and say if you didn't. Okay, number nine is the exemption from collective bargaining. Um, uh, Ms. Wellens. Yes, so um, as drafted, um, one of the intents of this bill was to exempt the, the, this new use of force policy or changes to the use of force policy, the minimum standards um, of the use of force policy to exempt those from collective bargaining to instead put that on, put those um, under the direction solely of the chief. Um, through the, through discussions with the county attorney's office, um, they suggested that in order to better effectuate that intent, uh, they suggested instead of the language that we originally had in the bill about um, the minimum standards of the policy not being cons not being mandatory subjects of collective bargaining, instead they said it would be stronger to amend section 33-80 of the code, which specifically relates to co collective bargaining, and in particular, you'll see. Um, under that number nine C, uh, 38 dash 80 C, there um, are listed already list exemptions. The exemption already listed is that number one. And then the new one being proposed would be number two. I should also point out that um, because I know there's been some concern about that, that, um, that number one was intended to change that changing the word shall to must under number under item number one was intended to change the substance of that exemption that was not the intent and just for the record i want to say that the county attorney's office neither they nor the police suggested removing that shall it was actually me just in the course of um legislative drafting our practice as council staff were many, many years, at least 10 years, has been to just routinely change shell to must because shell is an antiquated term. So the intent here was not to change any substance. Um, so I think the options before the, the committee would be to you know, leave the language as originally presented the bill, leave it as is, or you could um, you could make this, this um, you can amend it, amend it as um, I've outlined here. Uh, that was based on the recommendation of the county attorney's office. Um, but as I mentioned, has that nuance with the shell to must. You could make the amendment with just 
not disturbing the shell in item number one, just to, you know, assure everyone that the intent is not to change the meaning, the meaning of that first exemption, which is really not even the subject matter of this bill. I hope that made sense. Thank you. No, it does. And I appreciate your explanation. Council member Juwando, wherever you are. I'm here. Yeah, hopefully soon. Thank you, Ms. Wellens. And I actually, I agree with the suggestion of the county attorney's office here and Ms. Wellens' interpretation of it, that the goal here of the original bill was that this policy, use of force policy, would be exempted from collective bargaining negotiations and the chief would have control over the process and consultation as laid out in the bill with community members, et cetera. And that, and that, that is the intent. And I think adding it as an exception strengthens that intent and makes it very clear that this, this is not subject. This can't be, for example, weakened or changed or watered down through any sort of negotiation process. And I think, so I would be urged the committee to, to adopt this amendment, including these standards and the exceptions from collective bargaining. So that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thank you, chief. Did you have a comment on this one? Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. So I want to express the county executive's opposition to this. He has, wants to make sure that, that he supports the collective bargaining provisions of the bill as it was drafted, which amends section 35 of the code. He opposes amending section 3380C of the code that's suggested in the council staff memo he believes is unnecessary and, and could have the unintended consequences of putting FOP collective bargaining law out of alignment with the GO and IAFF law. Just wanted to note that this was not the intent of the bill clearly and would be beyond the scope. So I just wanted to make sure that that was noted. Okay. Thank you. Council members Hucker and Aldernaz, where, where are you on this one? I, I support the bill as drafted, Mr. Chairman. I, I am not in support of the county executive, county attorney's position. I agree with the county executive on this. And I think that would, that would lead to, you know, some confusion and unintended consequences. And I, again, I support the bill as drafted. Okay. Council member Aldernaz. Can, can we discuss shall and must a little bit more? I still don't understand that distinction. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Oh, sorry. I, yes. Great question. The council has a drafting manual that recommends every instance where we see shall that's in, happens to be included in a bill. We change it to must because the idea is that must very clearly is, is kind of a more modern language, but also very clearly states that something is mandatory. I think that the problem is that arguably shall could mean we will do this instead of we must do this. I think that's the rub. Again, like the, it was not intended as a substantive change. The idea is just shall meet shall means must in this situation, just like it does throughout the rest of the code where we, you know, where, where in the prior drafting years, we would use shall to mean must. Now we use must to mean must. And we try to update that when it comes up in a bill. Candidly, and council member, I was going to get right back to you, but if this, if shall means must, and this has caused so much angst about the, the word shall, then as far as I'm concerned, we can leave it. It's the same meaning. And I don't know that we need to cause all that excitement. Council member, I interrupted. Please. No, I think that's right. I think that the exemption is important, but, but I think having the term shall to be consistent, I think is, is reasonable and still is in line with the intent of the exemption. Thank you. Council member Juwanda. I just want to make sure we're clear because I'm not, I'm not disagreeing on the shell must. They mean they will be interpreted the same by the court, even though one is outdated. I'm talking about the substantive OCA amendment 
which is the, the secondary part. I just want to make sure we're all talking the same, not talking past each other. That says that would include the minimum standards of the use of force policy of this broader bill that we've all, you know, pretty much gone through and approved that they would not be uh, subject to collective bargaining, which the bill already states, but that a lengthy and very comprehensive, and maybe Ms. Roberts wants to mention, talk about this, OCA memo talked about how that that intent could be undermined if, if the uh, policy is just considered an employer right, as opposed to exempt from collective bargaining altogether. If it's just considered an employer right, which is what OCA is saying that the bill as currently drafted would do, even though the intent was to remove this use of force policy from being collective bargained, if it was considered an employer right by the panel who determines those things, it, parts of the policy could then be subject to collective bargaining, which is not the intent of the bill. And so what OCA is suggesting, again, Ms. Roberts, I'd love to hear you chime in, is that to just be 100% clear that the use of force policy would be put in an exemption altogether so there's no ambiguity uh, that it could be just considered an employer right. Uh, Ms. Roberts, can you comment on that? Ms. Roberts works for the state's attorney's office, right? Don't you? <laughs> no, I work for the county attorney's oh, county office. Attorney's office. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so since the county attorney submitted uh, our legal memorandum, the um, county executive's position, as the chief outlined, has changed in that the county executive's position, of course, is to support the original um, verbiage that was in the original bill and not the county attorney's um, suggested amendment of changing 3380 of the police labor relations article. Um, and I think that the in, uh, initial view from the county attorney's office was to try to seek clarity if that was what the county executive and, and what the council was looking for in that just exempting it in this bill may not necessarily exempt com certain components of the um, use of force policy from being bargained. There may still be aspects of it that could be subject to bargaining under the police labor relations article. So the police labor relations article outlines specific items which are mandatory subjects of bargaining for which the county has an obligation to bargain with um, the union um, over those subjects. And so if the intent of the council is to eliminate all aspects of a use of force policy from any potential bargaining that the union could assert, um, which is their right under the police labor relations article, then the mechanism by which you would actually el um, eliminate any bargaining would have to come under an amendment to section 3380 of the police labor relations article as opposed to just the verbiage that was put in place here. Does that clarify? Yeah. No, it does. You restated, I think, rather well what I said. And and I understand that you have the dual role in the county attorney's office of representing both the council and the executive. And I understand his position on this. I just want to make sure my colleagues are crystal in the public are crystal clear that if we don't add this amendment, some of the articles in this use of force policy could be collectively bargained by the union thus removing the authority of the chief to promulgate that policy. That's been something we've talked about in other areas. And I know there's colleagues that are working on the bills to make sure the chief has more uh, power on accountability and discipline. I think this would be a totally controvert the intent of the law to remove this from collective bargaining if we don't add this secondary amendment. The shell and must is fine. I'm, we can leave the shell. But I really think we are, we are changing the overall intent of the bill if we do not add this amendment. It, it's my understanding, and, and someone please correct me, uh, it's never if I'm wrong, it's when I'm wrong, but um, that right now the the uh, Fraternal Order of Police do not bargain over these items now that they are already management rights. Is that correct, Chief? Well, yes and no. So the, the, the point being is that um, I can... Um, I can um, present a policy, but the but the FOP still has the ability, and I still have to notice the FOP, um, and they can request to bargain any directive, um, in which I actually um, and and therefore then the county, um, in most cases has to bargain with them. So so there is an existent uh, policy that says that we still have to, um, though we have management rights, but. 
there are still some things that we're still going to have to bargain, and this would be one of them. And, so, and, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, in the example, Chief, was what you just did with we're codifying in this bill the duty to intervene. It's not a subject of an amendment yet, but you, that was collectively bargained as well, correct? Yeah, but that was, that was yeah, but we were able to come to an agreement very quickly, right? Right, I got uh, which, is, which is not, I'm not going to say that's always the case, right, depending upon what the issue is. Right, and my point is the intent of the bill was that these would, this is such an important policy, use of force, that it should not be collectively bargained in this way, and that was the intent of the original language, and if we really wanted to make that true, we need to include it in, in this, uh, include this amendment, that's all I'm saying. But I believe that we need to make it as narrow as possible. So it's just on this issue that's not collectively bargained, but but everything else stays the same and keeping shall where it is and, and all of that. Yes. So um, is, is um, Lee Holland from the FOP, is he on the call? Ms. Parsons, can you see if Lee Holland from the FOP? Is someone checking if Lee Holland is on the call? I, I, I don't, but I, I know he's not on the screen. I don't know if he's on the call. It's like Councilman Robin, I was just trying to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Albernos, please. No, I, 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 well, we'll wait for Mr. Holland to speak. Um, and then I, I just, I, I support the amendment because um, I do think it restricts it to this specific item. And I also support changing must to shall um, to ensure consistency with uh, labor practices in general. Um, but I, I think it's been stated well by both Ms. Roberts and Mr. Tawando. And I think to uh, Chief Jones's point, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that this is consistent. Thank you. Uh, Count, uh, Mr. Holland is going to call in. And then while he's calling in, um, Council Member Rice. I'm going to again be very quick if I can. Um, the same, same sort of idea. Um, and, and I respect Vice President Hucker and what he's saying in terms of having differential treatment between unions. Let me just say that in this case, we are talking about use of force that ends up in the possible death of a person. Um, we don't have that same sort of responsibility with a ride on bus driver or a person who works in our you know, uh, machine shop uh, who regularly on a daily basis has to make these kinds of decisions. And so it is something it is a little bit different, and if and I agree with what you said, Mr. President. If it's narrowly tailored to just this, then it is something that I do believe is justified in being carved out and separated, uh, and, and understanding and trying to be respectful of the union process and the grievance process that comes into play. But I mean, when we're talking about something that results in you know the the physical harm of someone. That isn't something that typically most of our other county employees have to deal with uh, and on a daily basis, right? And so, and, 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 and so that's where it's different. And I understand it's frustrating to our Fraternal Order of Police. And trust me, I've had some initial conversations with them. So I respect and understand where they're coming from in their position, being that it puts them at a different sort of bargaining air arena from where uh, other uh, bargaining units are. But we also have to understand that they are different in terms of the roles that they play, even with our firefighters who are emergency responders, but still don't use deadly force or might need to use deadly force to actually, you know, in the course of their job, right? That's part of their job description that they may have to do this every single day they walk out of their house, right? So, I mean, it's, it's those kinds of things that are different that I think, you know, warrants us treating this a little bit differently. And, and to your point, the... When, when someone who is a firefighter or some other occupation is in that type of situation, they call on their police to take care of that problem. I mean, they, you know, that's, that's, that is a difference. Did Mr. Holland make it on to the call?
you know what, I, I think if it's possible, although, why don't we leave this one for the moment and see if Mr. Holland gets on the call, and then we'll go to, to, um, to 10, the technical amendment, to change from reasonable alternatives to alternatives. And then if, if, if and when Mr. Holland gets on, well, he's on the call right now, I think. Mr. Holland, if you could please unmute yourself. There you go. Are you on the call? Here. Yeah, there you go. Thank you for thank you for doing this. I'm sure it was not easy. Um, well, I didn't have those numbers so. for the moment. Which you're you're getting some feedback, and then we'll go to to um, to ten here and myself. Well, you're going to have to cut off your computer, I guess. Alternatives, uh, and then if, if if and when Mr. Holland gets on. Better. Yeah, better. Okay, I've already heard me. That that's not something <laughs> I want to hear. Anyhow, go ahead. So uh, there are some questions, and I just one of the questions repeated. I forgot what they were. Well, the the, the well the, the 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 discussion has been about whether or not if we crafted, and I think there's sentiment to do this, but if we crafted in the uh, that that this would not be bargainable, but everything else that you bargain is still bargainable. And that's where the committee was heading. But I wanted to hear, wanted you to hear it, and wanted to hear from you if you. If you had other thoughts. So under the bill, what is being proposed in the bill, the minimum standards, those are things we don't bargain now anyways. <clears throat> the USA uh, or the duty to intervene is passed through a process that we use that says that we get to respond to say if something is bargainable or not bargainable. At that point, we never even wrote a response. We called uh, Chief Jones and we suggested some language and he said he agreed with the language and that's how that was done. So. Just because there's a process doesn't mean everything is bargainable. So the things in this bill right now are not bargainable. We don't bargain over. That's the employer's right to determine uh, what force would be used and how it would be used. We don't bargain over those aspects. So, and not to put words in your mouth, uh, Ali, but but if that's the case, and it would not, if if we said in, in a very narrow way that this is what we're what we're intending, then it would not have an effect. I'm asking it, it would it it should not have an effect on what you're doing. No, but the way the bill was written is it codifies that that's not the intent the way it is, and I don't think opening up the PLRA is necessary in this instant because we don't bargain over it now, and the PLRA speaks for itself. Um, that's why we are opposed to changing anything in the PLRA and and leaving the language if we have to in the bill itself of codifying the language that is these minimum standards are not going to be the subject of collective bargaining and that they are a management right, which is what the PLRA states now. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I don't know, Ms. Wellens, is that the way he has said it, I believe what I'm suggesting is, is, a, is a fair way to do this, um, and it's not um, affecting what they're doing now. Is, is there, a, and I don't know that I have the sentiment of the, of the uh, committee, but is that something that you could could work could word so that it, it is a in effect doing that? Um, yes, um, I think that. I I mean I, I agree with the statements um, that you've made, Councilmember Katz, and how you've characterized it. Um, I do believe that putting this exception in thirty three eighty C would be clearer um, and better to effectuate the, in, this, you know, which was the intent, maybe it's not the intent, but if it is the intent to exempt these minimum standards from collective bargaining, it would be helpful to clearly state that in the collective bargaining law. Um, but again, without changing any of the language that is currently there, and I mean, without um, I'm sp speaking specifically to the exemption without changing in any way the exemptions that are already there. Just adding this narrowly tailored exemption regarding the minimum standards of the use of for force policy under Section 35-22. Um, thank you. Councilmember Jawando, are you in agreement with what has just been said? This is getting a little confusing at this point. I, I think what I heard, yes, is that we would accept the amendment, which is a narrowly tailored amendment to uh, include as an exemption in the labor relations law, 
this minimum standards for use of force policy that are not bargainable, which is the intent of the bill. And so, yes, I, I agree with what Ms. Wellen stated, uh, and that, that which would be in my, to accept the amendment from OCA. Okay. Mr. Hucker and Mr. Council Member Hucker and Council Member Auburn where are you on this? Uh, I agree with Ms. Wellens as well, again, with the provision that we use shall instead of must. But other than that, I'm, I'm, I agree. Okay. Council Member Hawker. Um, I, I'm not so comfortable. I don't feel like it's necessary. Um, so I guess I don't support it on those grounds. If uh, it's, it, we just heard the FOP say it's a management right. Um, they don't bargain it now. They don't anticipate bargaining it in the future. Um, uh, and they'll be the only party at the table with the county executive who also doesn't support the amendment. Um, I'm not sure how this is ever going to come up in bargaining. So to me, there's no need for the amendment. If, if I could just say, Mr. No. You, Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. If you're not done, Tom, go ahead. I'm sorry. Especially, I, I, you know, we have conflicting legal advice on this, and it, to me, I don't, I don't know that it adds anything. Yeah, and and I would just say we do not have conflicting legal advice. Uh, OCA. And, and our attorneys actually agree that if the intent of the bill is to remove this from collective bargaining, it would be to add this amendment. So there's, there is no conflicting legal advice. And you, you said the operative word, the FOP has no intention of bargaining for it. But if, if this is just considered a management right, they could potentially bargain components of it, which is again, not what we want in, in any future FOP or any future executive. So this is such an important policy, talking about the life of individuals. We, the point is to remove it. So I think uh, this is a that's what we should do, Mr. President. Great. I I'm in agreement with that. I, I believe that that uh, it has to be narrow it, to the narrowest degree, and and uh, and I think if we can craft that that way, and of course this is going to go to full committee and I mean to the full council. And so if there's any other discussion on it or if the wording is it needs to be changed or, or whatever, then we'll, we can discuss it at that point. But that's where I am. And, and Council Member Overnight, you're still in the same spot. We leave shall as it is and do that. So at this point, I guess that would be a 2-1 on, on that one issue. Are you clear, Ms. Wellens? Okay. Thank you. The next one is uh, number 10 of the 11. So we're getting close. Um, for the technical amendment to change reasonable alternatives to alternatives. Um, uh, Ms. Wellens, would you like to explain that to us? Um, yes, this is a non -sub this would be a non-substantive amendment um, because instead of using reasonable alternatives, we would simply use the term alternatives, but it would have the same definition that is contained in the bill currently. So it would not be a substantive change. It would essentially kind of get rid of some surplus language. Um, so that's up to the committee whether they'd like to make that change. Thank okay. you. Chief, did you have a comment on this? I'm gonna defer to uh, Ms. Roberts on this language. Okay, Ms. Roberts, please. I have no... Um... A comment, I, I agree that it's non-substantive, so, and it's just a technical change. Thank you. Kim. I, as far as I'm concerned, it's fine. I mean, uh, Council Members Tucker and Alvin Oz, where are you on this? That's good. No good. issue. I'm fine with it. Okay. So let's go to number 11, which is uh, another technical amendment to delete surplus language which I think we should probably do in the whole world in general, but but, <laughs> but anyhow, um, Ms. Wellens, would you like to explain that to us too, please? Um, yes, yeah, so this is a recommendation of the county attorney's office to um, remove the, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, on, on page, the top of page 13, you'll see the A, B, and C uh, paragraphs and the suggestion is to remove paragraph C, where it talks about reasonable alternatives. And the, the reason that that, was, that that can be considered surplus language is that um, under, under paragraph A, um, it's stated that such force is necessary. And then if we go back to the definition of necessary, that requires the exhaustion of reasonable alternatives so I think the idea was 
let's eliminate the C because it might cause confusion since we're just really restating the same thing. The only thing I would point out in relation to this is that in some ways I like C just because it people don't have to flip back and forth to the definitions as well. I think it might be to just, you know, a citizen who's reading the law, you know, or any person who's reading the law would, it might make it a little easier for them to follow. With that said, you know, I don't have any objection to changing it and reducing surplus language at the same time. Okay. Council members Hucker and Albernaz, are you okay with that? Yes, I'm seeing a head shake. I'm seeing two head shakes. Okay, so and that's a 3-0 on that one. So we've done the, at one point, what looked like it was not going to be an impossibility. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Wellen. I'm so sorry, but there's one issue that was not addressed in the packet that I just wanted to bring to your attention because the Silver Spring Justice Coalition sent you an email about it this morning, and I don't know the extent to which the council members have had time to look at that. And I believe that Council Member Jawando's office was also interested in it. The bill currently provides that, you know, as the police have already negotiated that they, that there's this duty to intervene. And the proposed amendment from some community groups was that there's a, one, a duty to intervene, but then also that any incident where an intervention has occurred must be reported up the chain to the supervisor. So I don't know if that's something that you want to broach at this time as the final issue associated with this work session. Thank you. Chief, do you have a comment on that? I mean, no, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we, you know, we have policy that requires officers to report, you know, anything that's, I think part of the duty to intervene requires an officer to intervene. And I don't have enough information to state, but I know we've got some other policy that, you know, for individuals to bring these things forward to their supervisors for anything that they see of misconduct conducted by our officers. And I'll just say the idea here, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Hunter. I was going to speak in favor, Mr. President. I don't see, Mr. Chair, I don't see any downside to doing this. The fact that it's already consistent with our policy, much of this bill only codifies our current policy and makes it more permanent. So to me, this is within the spirit of the bill and a helpful addition. Yeah. Counselor Giorando, are you going to agree with that? Yeah, I was just going to, I won't disagree with the agreement. Yeah, and that it's just in line with the duty to intervene to protect the officer who does and then make sure that that information is reported so it's transparent. And again, I think in line with what's already envisioned. So I'm fine with that as well. Council Member Albernoz. I support it, but I'll be candid. Beyond Ms. Wellens' description, I have not seen the formal language. I agree with the intent, but I reserve the right when we get to the full council to dive a little deeper into this and also give Chief Jones the chance to provide more information as well. So I'm going to abstain for now. I support it in principle, but I just, I don't, I don't have enough information beyond what just Ms. Wellens just described to be able to formally weigh in one way or the other. And I'm actually where you are. I think that, that in principle, I think it's a good discussion to have, but I do believe that should be before the full council since we have not had an opportunity to look at it or whatever, you know, this last minute. But, but I do believe that it would, however, it is written up so that when it comes to the full council, that that would be something that we, that we ask that the full council go to. But at this point, I think that it's fair to say that we have not made a determination on this one part. Is that. And I'll just say just very quickly, if, if it's, it's exactly has been described, I will support it. But I just want to have the chance to process it a little bit more than just being flat footed right now. Yeah. You and I are basically on this exact same wavelength and council member Hucker was, was in favor of it right already. So anything else, Ms. Wellens? No, thank you very much. I know you just wanted to continue this meeting because it didn't go long enough. I knew that. I knew that. So thank you all very much for being on this part of the public safety committee meeting. We'll take the matter under advisement.
We're now going to go, only, only 45 minutes late, we're going to go to the HHS uh, Public Safety Joint Committee and uh, Councilmember Albernaz, the chair of, public, of the, uh, of the uh, HHS committee, will be leading this part of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we should uh, wait a minute for other people to jump off and others to jump on. Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> 